looks good. So, so you were talking about how um, you're going to pay me all of my money. Like you pay me like a thousand dollars now, right? Is that, is that is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. In fact, it's going to be twelve hundred. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And so that money is coming directly from me. I'm paying. I'm going to pay everyone else as well. <laughs> yeah. For for un, un undisclosed services. Yeah, and I, I don't know if we plan on time stamping this one for yeah. someone that may find it in the distant future. So this is, we're, we're oh, don't, in, oh, don't worry, pandemic. don't worry. It's it's the very few first few seconds of the video, so now everyone's going to see this first because we're live now. So perfect, perfect. Uh, so, okay. um, Aaron, how do you do? You, do you go by Aaron? Because I know Aaron likes Aaron, and it's really annoying. How do you? How what, what do you like to go by? Okay, I I mean Aaron is my actual name. Uh, so I do go by Aaron. The Aaron Aquinas is just kind of the sort of pseudonym that, that most YouTubers use because it's just, I'm not even a, a big Thomas Aquinas fan. It's just like the alliteration sounded good. My brother suggested, I'm like, all right, what? Yeah. So then that, that's the end of that story. Awesome. Awesome. That's good. Epic, long story. Conclusion. Climax. Yeah. You know, I got in a whole novel about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, just Aaron. I mean, it's actually my middle name. My parents chose to call me by my, I'm one of those kids that you know they they roll call robert i'm like well it's actually aaron because robert's my first name and you know i don't actually i I actually just recently watched a thing on skyrim like the 10 things craziest people did and the skyrim people when they released it on 11 11 11 actually said if someone named their kid dovahkiin if it was born on 11 11 11, they just give them all of the games from bethesda Mm -hmm. for the rest of their life and someone actually did that so there's some kid named dovahkiin who was born on 11, 11, 11, and now gets all of Bethesda's games for free for the rest of his life. Well, that's, that's cool that they actually did it. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I haven't heard of that. That's really cool. So, uh, Aaron, thanks for coming on. I think I think you actually reached out to me, didn't you? Yeah, was, we were on some thread on Twitter. I think it was Cameron's thread, and uh, you, you were offering it to someone else. And I'm like, hey, that sounds cool. And that, cool. See that story. Cool. Yeah. yeah. These, these stories are like the greatest stories ever. All right. I, I, I'm a great storyteller, yeah. as you guys will learn. So would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't think there's like a whole lot to tell. I'm no PhD. I don't have a, I don't have a published anything. I recently got into the like social media YouTube community on the like atheism, theism discussion. Cause I, I think it's interesting. And um, I've recently discovered you and you're one of the better content out there. Um, there is actually a lot of good producers out there and they're starting to gain traction. It seems to me that the smaller channels are more interesting, but interesting, I guess it's subjective, but it, it, they're more interesting to me because they're not as uh, clickbaity. They're not as like polished to be just a quick grab video, which I, I mean, I get like that's a lot of people don't have time to sit down for an hour or two and listen to something. So I get it. That's something I like. And um, I, I consider myself a theist, even though a lot of what I say over the course of our talk might, I mean, maybe doesn't sound traditional theism, but I think it is. It's just a kind of a different use of vocabulary and how we explain our concepts. I do think that a lot of them are the same. So I guess I, I consider myself a sort of classical theist. Um, I mean, there's really not much else to me. I mean, I'm also a gamer. I, I, I know you game. I don't know what games you play, though. So I, that's something I meant to ask you is like, what, what all games do you play? Um, right now I'm playing Neo 2. I don't know what that is. Um, is it a competitive game? Is it no? Is it's it like a, a one player. Do you know Dark Souls? Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's something like that. It's it's a harder version of Dark Souls, Japanese style. I've never played Dark Souls, but I have played uh, the very Lovecraftian one. I can't remember what it's called. You know, from the PS4. Um, there's Bloodborne. Bloodborne. That's it. The, I, I've played that one, and it's, it has a very Dark Souls vibe. I don't know if it's made by the same people. I'm assuming yeah, it, it probably is. Yeah, yeah I, I figured it was. I watched people in college dorms play Dark Souls a lot, but I never actually like, picked it up and played it myself. Yeah, I've always been into hard games. The harder, the better, because I that's kind of what I find interesting is trying to beat the hard ones. Dark Souls is actually really easy. People call it hard because it's hard for the normies. Beginners. Yeah, the normies. So, but yeah, it's it's really not that hard. There's a lot of there's a lot harder games out there. Cloudberry Kingdom is just fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Well. I, it, it must be pretty difficult. I mean, I definitely, I've never even heard of it. So it, yeah, yeah, the number of people that play it successfully must be low. I think uh, 20 total people have all the trophies in the game, like in the world. So the only game that I've completed all the way through, did all the things in, because I usually don't play those kind of games, was Resident Evil 4. 
the, the game was just cool. I liked it. And then I picked up because it was way different than the other Resident Evils before it in its style and and the way the the camera moved. So I picked up Resident Evil Zero, and that game is way harder. <laughs> and that wasn't yeah. even a hard game on the like hard scale. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, yeah. these games aren't for me. And then I, I played some competitive games. But that's that's really about it. Oh, I almost got everything in Donkey Kong 64. I had two blueprints left and one gold banana left, and then my my little toddler cousin deleted the file. <laughs> so that was fun. Like way back yeah. when that was a thing on on Nintendo 64. Yeah. So, um, to jump it right in, why I am an atheist, by which I mean I don't believe there's any reason to believe in a god. I think that everything can be better answered by naturalist, naturalistic explanations. Why do you believe in a god? Do you have any reasons or arguments or anything? So, I, I, thought are... about, I thought about this question and how I might approach it. And, uh, I mean, typically, you want to give a reason why you believe something. So, they usually give arguments, like naturally allergy arguments. And I find the, the bulk of them persuasive myself, but something I've said... I said in another talk I had with the street epistemologist guy, I don't think theism is compelling. Like, and, and by compelling, I mean, I don't think it's, it, it will compel belief against all other measures. Like I think most things in science probably do. So I don't think theism is compelling in that sense. I think it can be reasonable to believe it's true. And an analogy I recently came up with or figured out, I think would be reasonably appropriate is um, extraterrestrial life. Like, we don't have any, like, hard empirical data that it is there, but it's pretty reasonable to believe it is there. So I think theism can be like that, although I don't think it's necessary to believe it is. But okay. I definitely don't think it's compelling. Okay, so, well, yeah, I, I don't, I'm fine with just any standard of evidence. It doesn't need to be scientific empirical proof. But what evidence is, is just any way to differentiate, is it imaginary from is it real? It doesn't have to do with 100% certainty. Just give us a reason to believe that this thing, whatever we're talking about, is not an imaginary thing. So if you think any of the arguments can do that, because I don't think any of them do that. I don't think any of the standards of evidence for Christianity can differentiate, is this an imaginary thing from is this a real thing? So that's my position. Do you think that any of them can do that? Well, so, I mean, I think so. And and how I see that might be different than you. But uh, getting to, like, Christian theism is a whole other large step of premises to adopt. So I think that... All right, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just talking about any God in general. I don't particular theism i usually don't go into because my my goal is just to eliminate the entire concept of a god as nothing more than like a fairy tale like leprechauns or unicorns that's kind of how i see it so i don't go specifically and ask for evidence of a particular kind of a god that's usually not something i'm as yeah. interested in because if i can just get rid of the idea of god as an entire concept well it doesn't doesn't really matter which one you believe in yeah and, and obviously the the idea that's being adopted that we we call god can not only differ from, from cultures and religious but even person to person but i think there's a at least how i see theism at least generally speaking not not necessarily like a sort of religious tradition is how they're understanding the concept in whatever capacity they have or whether how limited that might be because that's clearly true in, in several other phenomena and other forms of knowledge that we have especially as it gets more sophisticated like uh clearly we understood what light was in a very rudimentary sense without understanding the physics of light right and i think people although they have a maybe a much more anthropomorphized version of what we would call god especially with very human characteristics can be describing something that that is a real feature of the world on a, on a more fundamental level and so that's how i kind of see theism classical theism in a sense but christian propositions are obviously something you add on to that so that i mean i i i'm not gonna like shy away from it. I'll, I'll, I'll answer a question um, I believe in the essential truth claims of Christianity, but I, I don't know if I'd classify as a fundamentalist Christian or anything like that. Okay, does God have a brain, a mind of some kind? Well, I, I definitely don't think God has a brain in the sense, right. like, except yeah. for maybe, except for maybe in the sort of incarnation sense that Christians believe about right. Jesus. Oh, yeah, that was God's that brain. was my habits of because I don't think uh, mind is yeah. a thing. Does God have a mind? <clears throat> well, I mean, so I, I could say yes. I mean, that's a pretty classical theistic response, but I think how we understand the word mind in this context might differ because I think you probably see the mind as an emergent property of the brain. Well, no, no. So and, I just mean like, is it conscious? Does it have thoughts and intentions and motivations? Can it know things? Can it respond? Can it well, interact? So, or is it like a, just a platonic in, inanimate object? So, I mean, so my quick answer is I do believe that, but the reason I believe that and what I mean by believing that I think might vary from the, 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 that rudimentary concept of anthropomorphizing our properties of a brain and a consciousness and stuff like that. And I'm not talking in a pantheistic sense where it's just like, it's just synonymous with, with ultimate reality. I think it, it's meaningful to make that distinction 
But my short answer is yes, I do think those things would be reasonable to believe about what we considered this ultimate reality that we're calling God or whatever the theist is calling it. So there is, because you mentioned pantheism, pantheism is a great example of just an, essentially an eternal, all powerful nature with no mind of any kind. It's just unguided natural processes all the way down, essentially. So why do you think there is a mind as opposed to unguided natural processes all the way down? Well, here's how I think, um, here's how I think the question you're asking, here's how I'm understanding it. Why would it be appropriate or useful to call it conscious or having a mind? Like, it's not that I think it like, okay, this thing is here. And then I have other evidence that like it has this extra property. I mean, that's one way to think about it. But I think it's like, why describe the phenomenon that we are inferring to as being conscious? Like, why would that be an appropriate description of what I believe is real? Um, and I think the properties that we're um, inferring from this, I believe can be reasonable to infer from our own experience of what we consider to be a mind. And I don't mean that as a purely emergent property of the brain, because I think that's also a true fact we could use to describe it. But that'll come down to what we consider the essential properties of a mind. Because if in advance, the essential properties of the mind is a brain, then just in advance, it can't have a mind. So if that's what we're defining as a mind, then I would agree with you. It doesn't have a mind. I just don't think that's the essential property of a mind is, is a brain. Right, right. So, but it is conscious. That's the, the essential property of a mind is consciousness. It has to have consciousness. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think the, the, the word, my, I, I don't even know, wanna, know if I want to say God has a mind. I mean, that, like, that's one way to, that's one vocabulary you can use. But I think God being conscious or God being personal would be just as a true description. I mean, you can say those are synonymous. I think having a mind has other connotations to it, but, um, I think the essential properties of of personhood would involve consciousness, intentionality, um, volitions or a will, rationality, things like that. Right, right. So like I there, think, there's different... I think it, it could be, and this isn't an argument yet so much, but explain why I believe this. I think it could be, I think it's reasonable to believe that the, the sort of ultimate metaphysical reality, whatever we're calling it, it would be reasonable to describe these properties to that. I think, I think it could be considered. Right, I, I wouldn't so, say it's compelling, but. So when we're contrasting things like pantheism, which says, God and the divine are everything with no mind. To your view, you're saying that God does have a mind and it's conscious as opposed to their view, which there is no consciousness there. I, I would say that would, that would be accurate. Okay, yeah. why? Well, I think the ultimate reality that we're describing here and which I would attribute the sort of modal necessity properties to it, I think it makes more sense to say that that producing any contingent reality would make more sense on a volition than a purely sort of natural process that exists in a sort of mechanism. I think how? That, that's a reasonable to believe. How? Well, the the how question, it depends on what you mean by how. If you're asking well, you, you how, said that the everything being created under a conscious volition is more likely than no, 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 that's how I said. something like that. I said, I said it would make it would make more sense to describe it as a volition on its essential properties of what we mean to say a volition, which is understanding that it would be the first cause of the process, than it just being a part of some pre-existing mechanical law that would just describe it necessarily happening, because otherwise it wouldn't be contingent reality. Like I, that's just I, definition. I, I have no idea what you just said. So okay, well, from my perspective, to, um, I don't want to throw a word salad out. So, so, so there's there's a God it. who has a volition, and the volition created the universe. And my position is, is there is a reality, a natural reality. A natural reality has processes, and the processes created the universe. Which, why is one more likely than the other? Well, I'm not, I'm not certain what you just described is necessarily essentially different. So I, it'll, I'm gonna. One, have to one has consciousness, one that. doesn't. Well, you, what you were describing was a difference of consciousness. So when you say there's a process that brought about the universe, if we're, whatever we. Yeah, it's just, a, just a natural form. process, like a law of physics, essentially a law of nature. There's no thought, well, no well, volition, no consciousness, no. Well, Intentionality. You, when you say a natural process, what's the difference between that and a volition? Um, there's as no, far as you're describing. Well, that, that's kind of the point is that a natural process is an unguided natural process. Just gravity is an unguided natural process. There's no consciousness there. It's not deciding to do something. It has no volition to cause people to fall. It just does. It's just a part of what it is fundamentally. Okay. I think we probably agree with that. So so with that being, so if I'm understanding, so and the reason I'm, I don't mean to answer questions with questions, but I'm wanting to make sure I'm understanding the yeah, no no of your vocabulary. Because I think that's one of the, the challenges is having an understanding of vocabulary. When you say a, a natural process, I think from what you described, I would agree with. What would be a meaningful difference between, because I think there is one, you probably do too. What do you think is a meaningful difference between a, a natural law that's a descriptive property of, say, 
gravity bending space time in a certain way where things follow the geodesic and we consider that falling right so uh, given the conditions it's a purely natural process there's not some agent intervention that comes in there and tinkers with it right yeah. so what's, what would be the difference between that and contingent reality arriving from some necessary reality like what what, what do you what's a meaningful difference there, there wouldn't be a difference because my argument is that there is a necessary reality i agree there is a necessary reality and it's just eternal and powerful nature with no mind Okay, so if I'm saying that I, I, as far as the description that I just gave of a necessary reality giving rise to a contingent reality would be synonymous with a first causation, and no. that's what that's what a volition is. No. And I'm calling, no. Well, that's what I'm saying. So what would be a volition to you then? A volition is intentionality. It's a mind, it's a choice, well, what, decision, consciousness doing about? something. Well, so if, if, if a volition, can a volition have causal relations? Sure, yeah. Okay, so if a volition has causal relations, what what does that mean to you? What does it mean for a volition to cause something? Um, the the volition was the precursor to the event without which would not have happened. Okay, so that would be the true states of affairs. But what does it mean for the volition to to be the cause of the effect? The volition has to be or the thing you... that caused the effect without of which it would not have happened make sure I'm, saying, I'm, not, I'm not certain maybe that may have answered my question i'm just not understanding it so so, like so the volition is like there's a conscious actor who makes a choice and if that conscious actor did not make that choice then the event would not have occurred there's a, so there's some internal languages being used here so the word choice and volition can be kind of synonyms well no, so no, no. A, a volition is like uh, intentionality it's like i have a decision or a, des a desire to do something uh, the choice is the actual action of choosing to do that thing. So volition is just an intentionality. It's a desire of some kind. And then the choice to enact that decision is not the same thing as the, the feeling or desire itself. Okay, let's go with that. So what would be a choice? Does choice have causal relationships with effects? Um, I would say so. I mean, I think all choices are determined, so I don't think there really isn't a choice, but yeah. Yeah, and I think this might be where a bit of a breakdown is because like in the entire time, if, if choice or how I'm using the word volition just isn't a thing in your background information, then it, none of this probably makes sense of what I'm saying, or at least it doesn't seem reasonable. Well, I can just grant it for the sake of argument. I understand the okay. idea of so, volition. So for that sake of argument, how do you understand a choice having a relationship with effects? Like how does it cause the effect? Um, magic, essentially. Like if you think there is this new kind of a thing like a volition and that's essentially like a force like any other and it can do things it's just a different kind of a force it's just one that is related to consciousness in some way i don't okay. know exactly how it would do that i just say magic essentially but it it does things in a non-physical sense essentially yeah, it's not yeah. a okay. guided okay. law of nature okay now i feel like we're making some progress so i think you're going in the right direction i mean i, I mean you can call it magic i'm not really i'm not as offended by that word as a lot of theists seem to be um but the uh, the point you're touching on, which I think is right, is that it's not a part of some physical structure, deterministic structure that has predictive power that you can say, because this will be this way, it'll operate and then the effect is produced. I think that's right. And that's what I see this necessary reality being, because it's not a part of some larger structure. It's not a part of some greater deterministic mechanisms that describe what it will do. It's just necessary. And if it gives rise to something contingent, as far as we understand in our properly basic way of what we experience on our own volitions, which, I mean, you, we can break down in other ways to say, well, we have other reasons to believe that there aren't minds, which we can include that. But just for the sake of this, I think it, it's reasonable, not compelling, to believe that that same phenomenon is what we're using to describe the act of contingent reality becoming real. Um, okay, so I'm still not seeing anything in there that's actually an argument for consciousness so because I, I agree there is a necessary thing like absolutely the necessary thing is just nature it's just more nature there's no mind there there's no consciousness no volition none of that is even relevant well so it's far so using the word nature here for a second do you believe minds are a product of nature yes so if it was a mind it would still be nature right no because the mind would be a product of nature nature is the ultimate thing not the mind okay so what is nature just essentially we, are we just again, using the word so, so nature just, is ultimate reality yeah, I'm just using the distinction here of a, a mindless nature and a minded nature. So what is at the core? Okay. Is it just a mindless thing or is it a mind thing? If it's a mindless thing, that's just naturalism, essentially. If it's a mind thing, then that's supernatural. Supernatural is essentially synonymous with a non-physical mind doing stuff. That's what it means, essentially. So if there is a non-physical mind doing stuff, that's 
theism, essentially. And if it's just a non-mind, unguided processes, that's naturalism. Yeah, and I, I, that, that's the typical dichotomy on theism, naturalism debate. But I think it, uh, the vocabulary is important because how we're understanding these, especially when we're, if, if we're not oversimplifying it, can sometimes there's not meaningful disagreements between these words. So, for example, if you say nature is the ultimate reality, and that, that's the word we're describing, this necessarily existing thing that just is true in all possible worlds, and then the contingent facts may differ. We might not be disagreeing on what is real about that. We're just calling it something different. Right. So, it's again, so again, the difference is always going to be consciousness. On yeah, the yeah. naturalistic so view, is there is no consciousness. That, yeah. At what point would it be appropriate to use the descriptions that we find the central properties with consciousness, mind, volition, etc.? And what I see as the essential properties of those things, based on our what we consider ourselves a person, and this there's probably a breakdown here but between how we understand this about ourselves, but I see that the, those central properties also applying in the circumstances between the natural, the necessary, how? and the reality. Well, the first one I explained is the the first causation of contingent reality being described by what I what I explained as volition. Well, that's why I said, how is that described by volition and not just natural processes, no volition? Like, what's the difference? Why so, so what, I'm, what I'm describing as volition is the essential property of volition because there's there's other properties. The essential property being that it is the the it is a first cause in a causal chain, the absolute first cause in a causal chain. That's begging that's the question. Theory. So, you do not need volition to be a first cause in a causal chain. You can have just pure natural processes to do that. So. I could say okay, but I think we're just calling the same thing. By no, no. Nature. So there's no mind here. So in my view, there's no mind that can do it without any any kind of a mind. And well, and this is why when I mentioned pantheism earlier, I think that we're just describing the same things with different words. No, really no, because there's no mind. Again, so you said there's a mind, but I said there's no mind, so they cannot be the same thing. We, but we're not using the word mind the same way. Like that matters. Like I mean, you can say there's no mind. And what do you mean? I'm work. granting your definition of mind here. So mind is in being personal and being able to interact and believe things and have thoughts. Well, I only gave yeah, yeah, I'm only giving, I, I guess you can bunch them together. So when I say the the essential property of the mind is a will or a volition, having a volition, being able to have a volition, and I'm saying that that's a volition, then it just follow that it's a mind or it, it has mental properties, I guess you could say. Having a mind, like I said, there's connotations to that, that I think we're acquainted with right. ourselves having minds. Right. So so gravity does not have a volition. It just acts. Yeah. I'll agree so with that. the first cause could just be like that. There's no need for any volition. Okay, so let, let's 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 break that down then. So explain that to me. I'm not I'm not sure I'm understanding. The first cause in a causal chain could just be a natural thing like gravity. There's no need for a volition. Well, if if I'm just defining that to be a volition, what's the difference? If you're just defining it as a volition, it just becomes ambiguous and meaningless. It just does nothing. I mean, there, there's meaning to that. A volition is that which is the first cause of a causal chain. So if that's the definition of a volition, at then, least the essential property. Then that would not be evidence of a mind because that definition doesn't tell you whether it's minded or not minded. Okay, so what if when I say mind, that's what I mean by mind? Well, then you're not answering the question because my question is, is why do we believe it has consciousness as opposed to not consciousness? Because you, you can just use whatever words you want. Say it's a blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that doesn't uh, tell us, that doesn't, that doesn't give like, us any reason to believe in theism as opposed to naturalism well okay are, are you granting it then just make sure i'm understanding we're on the same page that there is a first cause from this necessary reality to the contingent reality sure okay sure so i'm what i'm saying is i think that's an essential property of what a volition is and i think a volition is the essential property of a mind or consciousness whatever you want to call it okay so, so that's just there. that's just defining mind and volition as being the first cause but that doesn't again so my question is is why should we believe in naturalism over theism if we just want to define those things as volition and cause well it doesn't give us any reason to believe theism or naturalism because we're just defining whatever the first cause is to be these words it doesn't actually give us any evidence that one is a conscious entity and one is just natural non-conscious entity well, I'm, I'm trying to get to the root of what is meant by the things that are explained by i think a, in good good faith explained by most theists that are using more rudimental rudimentary vocabulary because like i mentioned in the other example about light i mean you can explain or know where light is without knowing the physics of it and right. i think this these are the essential properties of what this the, the mind or god is when we call it theism and a lot of the time i think it's well specifically with you granting a necessary reality which is not a very common thing granted by atheists well, actually, think, actually, it is. They just use different language for it. Yeah, well, that's how that's where I was going with that. Is I think a lot of the time we're agreeing on a lot of things with different vocabulary that doesn't make the debate progress very far, and that's where I was trying to get at with a lot of the 
breaking down of these words. Because right, right. That's, I, that's the what the fundamental difference is one has a mind, one doesn't. So the naturalist or the atheist, whatever, it doesn't matter what language you use, they hold the position that there is no mind at the ultimate necessary thing. No mind. The theist holds there is a mind. That is the difference. One so, has yeah. consciousness, one does not have consciousness. Yes, and another way to explain it is we're calling one's calling it a mind, one is not calling no, it. No, a no, mind. no, no. There's not calling it. This is an ontological difference. One believes well, there I is a there thing is that has yeah. awareness. And one yes. believes there is not a thing that has awareness. So, yeah, yeah, no, I'm we're we're on the same page, but I think it it will break down to the the things that we're agreeing on, and like I'm calling it a mind, and you're not. Well, like, calling it, what we call it doesn't make a difference because we, we believe there is an ontological difference. One believes that there is a thing that exists that has a mind and is aware, well, so and one believes there is not. From what I've what I've described to you, what differences do we have? I have no idea because you haven't actually given any differences. You've just defined your terms into existence. You just haven't you haven't given me anything. So that's why I said in the beginning, right. give me evidence of why I should believe there is a mind at the core, the necessary thing, and as opposed to a not mind. That's what I need to know before I can say there is a difference. Well, I haven't seen a difference yet either. Um, what I what I think a mind is is what I described. I think it's having a volition, which is a, a okay. Okay, but that that doesn't help me at all. So, maybe if you by your definition, there is no difference. Uh, you're just calling everything a mind. By your definition, there is no, no non mind. I, I, see, I, well, I don't think that follows. So that that's going to be How's a difference that? between us then. What, what's what's a non mind? Well, obviously, any effects of a mind wouldn't be a mind. Oh, okay. Like, like at least in a contingent sense. I mean, I think obviously. Okay, but effe effects, effects of a mind is isn't an ontology. Tell me, what is a non mind that is an ontology? A non mind. Well, a non mind would be any uh, reality that's whether it's an effect itself or a, a cause and effect that isn't the first cause, or doesn't have the ability. Okay, that's to be that's begging the question because now you've just said the first cause can only be a mind. So tell me, what is the difference between a mind and a non mind? The difference. So what I what I what I just described there. Was like begging the question. Theory. You just said everything that isn't the first cause is a non-mind. Okay, okay. Let, let me let me rewind for a second. So I define a volition as the essential property of a mind. So whatever is whatever ontically has volitions would be would at least have properties of mind, whether you want to call it a mind or has a mind. I, I don't really find that super meaningful. But if that's the essential property of that, then whatever has that and produces effects that aren't themselves first causes of causal chains, just like you said, by definition, I mean, you're calling it question begging, but I'm not putting it in a premise to a conclusion. I'm saying that's the contents of the words I'm using. Is right, that... right. I understand that. But so everyone who uses the word mind to mean consciousness does not use it in that way. So they don't care. Like you're no, just, I you're think just... You're right about that. No, I think you're right about that. And I think that's a, I, I, I'm, I honestly don't want to impute. Well, well that, that's what, that. that's what I'm asking. So I'm using mind in the classical sense, consciousness. Don't don't use mind in any other sense. We have to use the words in the way that most people use them to try and okay, so, make it meaningful to the audience. Mind is consciousness. What's what's consciousness? I don't I don't know if you told me what that is. Uh, awareness. 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 Yes. So so it, uh, awareness isn't consciousness. Consciousness is having awareness. No, no, they are literally the same thing. Awareness is okay, consciousness. So, okay, so what's awareness? Yes. If you're not going to question big, what's awareness? Awareness is like the ability to have input from things like you you have a sense experience is a kind of awareness like you have okay. input you can experience things like so having experience yes having experience that's okay what's what's having it what's having an experience i'm just i'm, I'm not finding the, the termination so i'm just i'm just what, curious like, what, I don't what, i'm not sure what you're asking here so oh consciousness, sorry what's having an experience oh, that was the question me I, oh, like a mind is having the experience I mean, we're circling back to mind. So a mind is having awareness. Awareness is having experience. Experiences. A mind. mind is the thing that is doing the experiencing, and the self, the consciousness, is the experience. Okay. So the question is, what is having an experience? What not? What, what is what is the ontology the of a mind? We have no idea. There could be lots of things that could be the ontology of a mind. Okay, that might be my question, but let me let me just phrase it differently to make sure we're understanding each other. So, what does it mean to have an experience? What, what does it mean to have an experience? Like, yes. I, I don't know the correct way to describe that. It's qualia. It's the fact that we have one. That's what it means. It's it is there is a input that we can respond to. We we see things. We hear things. We think. There is a process going on there. Okay, I think I think we're we're actually going to be on the same page on the sort of um, fundamental ex understanding of what it means to have an experience. Like, there, there's not going to be some further part you can go down to because like, like you can't explain anything without it. So I think we're actually probably going to agree with that. And building from there, um, it's whether or not, I think here's the question you're probably trying to get at. So I'm understanding it. It's like, 
can we say that what I'm the necessary reality can have experience? Well, no, it can. I grant it can. I'm, I'm saying, do we have a reason to believe it does? Like, I have experience. This cup does not have experience. Which oh, one is the ultimate necessary oh. thing? So I want to make sure I'm, I, I, want to, I don't want to misrepresent you. So when you say it can, you're saying it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's possible there's a God. So, so there, there's a possible world where this thing has experience. Um, so modal logic has massive problems. It does not work. Possible worlds are conceptual. They are not reality. So, okay, okay. Well, let's rewrite but, So, so, so just going, into, going into modal logic has a whole bunch of different problems to it. So just want to stick with the basic question. I'm conscious. This cup is not conscious. Which one is the necessary thing? Like the cup or like me? Necessary to consciousness, you mean? Like, no, I'm like not, the I'm necessary grounds of all reality with the first cause, essentially. Is it is it like me? Is it conscious? Or is it like the cup and not conscious? Well, I would say it's like you, obviously. Like right. I, I grant right. that before. And I'm saying why? Give me evidence well, to I, believe that. I, I don't want to lose the point on, that you just brought up here because... Um, when you like do do what I have to deny possible world semantics and modal logic to adopt what you're saying? Uh, no, most most philosophers who do adopt possible worlds reject the idea that of God for many reasons. Okay, so let's let's stick to that for a second. So, would would they adopt what you just said that it could be possible? Would they would they yes. agree with that? Okay, so they agree that there's a possible world where this yes. necessary. They, they reject the ontology of Plantinga's argument is just false. Hold so, on. Well, so, I'm not using Plantinga's argument. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm preempting your argument here so things that are possible are not possible in all possible worlds the necessary modal logic of s5 logic does not work that way so it's just it's false that okay, so it's, so it's possible I, that I it's... To, just to make sure i'm saying would i have to reject that to go along with what you're saying um yeah plantinga's particular version yes you have you have to reject plantinga's version that if it's possible then it is possible then it is necessary in all possible worlds yes that would just be false you, that has to be false so everyone most of people in philosophy grant that is false well, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. So you're saying that the, the the properties or the necessary property that he's explaining being true in all possible worlds, you're saying that's false? The fact that it's possible does not make it necessary. Well, that that's not what Plantinga said. Yeah, like, it is I, actually. Plantinga's modal argument says that if it's possible that there is a, a being who is, forget his terminology, maximally excellent, then it is existing in all possible worlds necessarily so it's, it's the possible necessarily goes to the it exists necessarily i had a debate with this two one one debate with this on ben arbor and the way it works is that if it's possible then it does in fact exist necessarily and that's kind of the crux of the ontological argument of planting his version which okay. everyone rejects so so do it do we you said i don't have to reject that possible means like the, the possible world semantics works I, I i don't have to reject that Possible world semantics is again just a semantics. It's just a way it's, of describing. It's, things. It, it, it's another way of describing other facts about propositions. Yes. Yes. So, so we're it's, on it's, it's just a version of logic. Yes. So what it means to say possible in, in an ontic sense, in a, in a no, problem. no possible is purely epistemic. You can't say possible in an ontic sense. Okay. Ontic, so what, ontic is I'm like not, ontological means what's existing. Yeah. So so you're saying you, oh, your claim? I want to make sure I heard, heard you right. Po possible is only epistemic. Yes, well, possible sure I heard that right. epistemic. Possible means we can imagine this existing. Okay, all right. So I, I do agree there, there's obviously an epistemic nature to the word possible, but I'm not sure that that only follows. At least I'm not saying I'm agreeing with that yet, so I want to make okay. sure I'm understanding that. So the, the, the possibility of, say, let me think. Uh, would it have been possible of the contingent facts of history, could they have been different? Uh, conceptually, yes. Is that an epistemic claim? Yes, conceptually, epistemic. So like like Al Gore could have been the president in 2001. There's nothing, there's no contradiction in that statement. Yes, conceptually. Okay. This means in our heads, we can imagine this being the case. Yeah, but is the is the content of the proposition coherent? Does it break any rules of logic? No, but again, that's all conceptual in our heads. So it's all epistemic. Well, I'm not saying that that itself is like platonically out there, right? So when I say ontic, that's not what I mean. Right. I'm talking about like the, maybe the word ontic may have been inappropriate. I'm talking about logically possible. How about that? Yeah, it's logically possible. Okay. All right. So if something, I think that's what possible worlds is addressing. So if something's logically possible, it's a description of a different reality of contingent facts that if they were true, then that's that world, but they're false in this world. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're on the same page there. So is necessarily true propositions true in all of them no that's like 
sort of yes, sort of no. So necessarily true propositions yeah. in modal logic, which is a language, uh -huh. are true in the language of modal logic. Are there other logics that reject that? Yes. Yeah, that's applied by what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so does modal logic describe reality? No, it's just a language. So the other languages could be right and modal logic could be wrong. Oh, so we even say modal though- logic describe reality. Um... So we, we might agree with that, but I'm not sure what you mean. So, you so modal like modal logic is a language. It's made up by humans. It's just like English. It's a formal language, but it's it's a language. And in modal logic, anything that is necessary is true in all possible worlds. That's just what it means by the definition. But is it actually true in all worlds that exist in reality? No, those are two yeah, separate I'm, things. I'm what it's saying. Yeah, okay. We're, we're on the same page there. Sure. If that's what you meant by that. So, so like modal logic doesn't describe reality. It's just a language. That's well, not... Sure. Okay. But I, like, so, so when we say modal logic, if it's only like, if something's true in all necessary or is necessarily true and is then true in all possible worlds in modal logic, that doesn't mean it's true in reality. Like there could be a possible world, for example, that exists in reality, which does not conform to modal logic. Okay. okay. Conform so, to quantum logic or okay, quasi logic. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's back up for a sec. So I, I, I agree with the, the language dichotomy. I agree. That's all true. Um, but with, saying describing reality it's not an emergent fact of the reality we, we observe that we describe because obviously we're describing things that are false with modal logic so i mean we're going to be on the same page there but when we say something is necessary is, is there a, the, the use of maximal description which is all the propositions that are true or well, well that's case, that's possible. that's the part i'm saying is that okay. the modal logic cannot describe reality exhaustively it doesn't work i mean it's not trying to like I, at least I, i've never heard someone claim that that's the point so well, that's, if you have that's, a, that's what that's what the all possible worlds thing is going for it's trying to say that if well, it can't exist in all possible worlds well then it can't exist in reality okay let me let me try to explain how i understand it and okay. we'll see it there's so uh because i don't know if it like again this might just be like how people are presenting it. um if you say i don't know if you're familiar with Proust, but Proust uses his big conjunctive contingent factor c uh, yeah, uh, I'll, yeah, I'm a familiar yeah. with Bruce. So, so Alexander he, Bruce, I think. You know, yeah, we don't have to use his argument that he uses, but the the concept of saying like you just have whether it's infinite or not, uh, the set of propositions that are just true. What we're that's just what we were calling actual reality, just a set of true. This you can you can organize it into a set of true propositions. No, so, that's the part where I'm saying no, that's obviously okay, okay. false. So we Let's have there are propositions yeah. like Schrodinger's cat, where a cat is both alive and dead at the same time, and those propositions can equally apply to reality. So uh, dichotomy using standard logic and modal logic just doesn't describe reality. Okay, well, no, explain that to me. I'm not I'm not following. Are you, are you familiar with Schrodinger's cat? I'm familiar with that that like this the paradox thing you're describing, but I'm not sure how you're relating it to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. In quantum mechanics, there are particles that both exist and don't exist at the same time, and that statement is true, even though it's a logical contradiction. So logical contradictions can't exist like that in standard logic and in modal logic, but reality just doesn't, doesn't care. Like well, Quantum let's, logic let's is a thing. That, let's take that quantum logic the route we're going here, because I, I want to see how it's dry, drawing these conclusions, because I know that this is a sort of physics point that people are going to bring up based on empirical data, but yeah. what they're inferring from this data, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to see where you're... When physics says a particle exists and doesn't exist at the same time, what's the observation you're referring to? Uh, I have no idea. I haven't researched the physics in a while, but it's just the Schrodinger equation. That's what it does. Quantum logic is a thing where those happen. Okay, so so why am I accepting this conclusion? Like because the the, the physicists say that this is what they observed. Yeah, that's how science works. Is that you make a prediction, well, I, it's confirmed, I, you accept it. I mean, I'll I'll accept I'll accept predictions obviously that that they can make this happen but what what is this prediction you're referring to where there, there's a part of i don't remember it, i'd have to research physics but it's pretty exists and doesn't exist when they use this language no that's that like literal it's meant as literal it does and doesn't exist literally but what, what is that describing i'm not understanding a particle that does and doesn't exist literally I, it's, I don't understand what that means um that's fine you don't have to understand what it means it, it works it's reality so, so if i if it seems to be meaningless to me like what is it then why why what do i do with it uh, you don't need to do anything with it. The point is just that your conceptual languages that do make sense to you, reality just doesn't care about those. Those aren't exhaustive. You can't use yeah, those you, as a guide for reality. When you say you're describing reality to me and with your language, then why why is that like why is that any different? Like be, I, you, you seem not. to be experiencing. You're going off this qualia that you seem to suggest. So, so essentially, hard. I'm arguing that your language system, which you believe can be used to describe reality, 
doesn't. It's incomplete. It doesn't give us anything oh. about reality. It's just a language system. Is that inference based on some qualia of saying that there's a, a particle that we, a qualia exists and doesn't exist? Is that our ultimate like inference that we're making? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You... Okay, okay. So, so why think that? Because there's an observation. Why, why are we trusting this ultimately? Like, I'm, not, I'm not following that. It makes this testable logic. predictions. So if it makes testable predictions, we have reason to believe it exists. It's true. Why? Like, why accept that? Because we need some way to differentiate between is something imaginary and is no, something no, no, real. I accept that. But I, I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where the conclusion that we're drawing from this, why, why are we thinking that's meaningful because of a prediction on how we're interpreting that data from our experience of that day, which is like the quality or whatever you want to call it? Um, that's how science works. Okay. All right. So, so what's this prediction that you're referring to where there's a particle that's existing and not existing? That's, where we're making that's, that you, you'd have to Google it. Google the Schrodinger equation to figure that out. Like I don't remember the physics, but it's the Schrodinger equation. So is this what they're saying? And, and you're just taking with the word. It's like, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm no, it's, it's literally the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation shows this. There are things that exist and don't exist at the same time. And the Schrodinger's cat is an analogy to this to make it conceivable for people. Okay, so that's where you're drawing the Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously not a, I'm not a physicist, so I'm no expert, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm granting the, this leap that they're making. Maybe they're right. I mean, sure, I guess, but I'm not sure that there's a meaningful description of what they're saying. And I know you're saying that my meaningful description of my language doesn't conform to reality, but when they say conform to reality, like this is ultimately based on what they're seeing as a prediction being verified from this experience that they have of an observation. Right. I'm not sure that's very meaningful. To them either like i'm like i think they're just saying the words and it's just meaningless right that was the argument I mean, used I mean, that's against do. Well, mean, that's I'm... the argument they used against einstein when he said time bends because the same thing is like well time can't bend time's a philosophical concept physical reality doesn't care if we can understand it just has doesn't care at all sure and i think i think the same i would agree with that as well and i'd say that i would a very similar response on how the, like, i know time's a whole other thing but i think it would apply equally as well of course time isn't something i necessarily was going to get into but i figured we might so, well, I mean, that's the point is that reality doesn't care if we can understand it. Reality just works. And so if we make testable predictions and it's completely incomprehensible, well, I mean, then it's true. It's no part of what I'm saying to say that I have to understand it for it to be real. Obviously, that's not true. Well, right. So but, so my point is, is that, again, modal logic just is just a language. It doesn't give us anything about it. It doesn't limit the way reality can be. It's just a limits the way we can imagine reality to be. Yeah, it is just a language, of course. I mean, it's not it's not like it makes reality the way it is. I mean, I'm, right. I, I don't know anyone that says that's true, but maybe people do. Alexander Pierce and Alvin yeah, yeah, sure. they might. They might. I, I don't really know. But like, so, so, yeah. so again, just going back to the main point, you're trying to say that what is ultimate nature of reality could be me, could be the cup. Which one is it? You're saying it's like me. Why? Sure. I mean, it, it, as far as that analogy breaks down, but I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, would you consider yourself, in, in so far as people have used these words, would you consider yourself like the, the positivist that they're, they're, people charge a lot? No, no one's a positivist anymore. Positivists died out a long time ago. Okay, so do, do we have to verify something or anything like that to make it reasonable to believe? Only if you're claiming it's a part of the world. Okay, is there, are there things that aren't part of the world that we believe are true? Yes. Like like what? 1 plus 1 equals 2, A equals A, bachelors are unmarried. Okay, so what, what do you, maybe we're operating on different, what, what do you mean by believe when you say we believe something? Like what, 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 what does that mean? We have an idea in our head, like... Well, I mean, so uh, the, this, I just kind of go with like a standard definition. It's just be, being convinced that something's true. Sure. sure. Okay. So when you when we say part of reality, are you thinking specifically like physical universe stuff? Like, or what do you when you when you include in that? Uh, yeah. So again, we have to. There's a difference between our imagination and reality. If I imagine a unicorn, I don't see a unicorn in front of me. If I say a unicorn exists, it exists in my head. It doesn't exist in reality. So the thing in my head is just a representation of a unicorn. It's not a unicorn. The unicorn does not exist in reality. So, so one plus one equals two is the same way. It's a representation, yes. It's a language that we use to describe reality, but it isn't. It doesn't exist in reality. There's no the one between one plus one equals two and the unicorn, meaningfully. Nothing. They're the same. They're just described. Oh, well, one one plus one equals two describes reality. The unicorn doesn't describe anything in reality. So, uh, comparative okay. would be like one plus one equals seven. That would be like a unicorn. So, so we can have ideas in our head that describe reality. Yes, like I can imagine there's a TV in front of me. That there is a TV in front of me. Sure. Okay. So, when we say, so if if, if you say that God is an idea in the mind, obviously that alone wouldn't say that there's not a God. 
Right, everything is an idea in your head. So okay, when you, okay, all right, so we got past that. I'm so, just, so we have I to go like, one step further. So is it just an idea in your head or is it also something that exists in reality? Okay, all right. So what, what would be the step that doesn't involve verificationism? Like this, whatever you want to call it. I have no idea what you're asking. Okay, right, so you said you're not a positivist. So we, yes. can, we can know things are true or believe things or whatever you want to call that without necessarily having to verify it. Right. Okay, so what would be necessary for you to believe something that's not just an idea in your head but it's also true about reality oh no that for reality you need you need some way to differentiate between imagination and reality it doesn't need to be empiricism it can be anything that'll work i don't know what will work but i know empiricism works but there are other things like empiricism specifically say it's all true knowledge is only empirical but there are other kinds of knowledge like conceptual knowledge like one plus one equals two that's true by definition you don't need empirical verification for that it's just a definition the Harry Potter has a scar on his forehead. That's true by definition because we define Harry Potter as that. You don't need empirical verification for that. It's purely conceptual. So knowledge can be broken down into several categories. One is conceptual, the stuff in our head. One is empirical, the stuff in the world. And third is metaphysical, the fundamental nature of reality stuff. I think therefore I am essentially. Okay, and, so when you say the world, I'm, I want to make sure I'm understanding your words here. What, 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 what is, what's all the world? That's not this metaphysical reality that you're referring to because you separated well, those. Me metaphysics is everything, yeah. Empiricism is just the stuff we can verify is not imaginary. Metaphysics is everything, is well, the fundamental nature of reality. It's just the stuff we can verify is not imaginary. What? Did I, did I hear you right? Empiricism is just verifying the stuff that isn't imaginary. Yeah, like, essentially like, the world imaginary. that we can experience. Now it could be so like we we're in the no. matrix, but it's can not imaginary. We, but we can't... Uh, Okay, all right. So the matrix wouldn't be imaginary. It, so so, be so imaginary. let me explain it to you this way. Okay. If I imagine a unicorn, I don't see a unicorn. Mm -hmm. There's some difference between these two things. We're yes. going to call this one the internal imaginary. We're going to call that one the external. We sure. don't know what their ontology is. Maybe we're in the matrix. Maybe we're all in an idealistic dream like in Hinduism or whatever. doesn't make a difference. There's some difference between this and that. That's the external, this is the internal, and we need to differ, a way to differentiate between the two. Is any particular thing I say exists, is it one of these things, or is it one of those things? Okay, I'm following. So, so, with the so if you say... It with empiricism as part of the world... I didn't say anything about empiricism in that. No, I know, but from what you said before, because you were, you were separating the, the world, the word the world, right. with metaphysical reality, and well, empiricism verifying what is real in the world... So I'm trying to I'm trying to draw the steps here. So so remember so we have the internal this is the this is the conceptual and then we have the external that's the empirical so we use empiricism to differentiate because we need some way to differentiate between these two and that's what empiricism does. Metaphysics is a different category that isn't 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 involved in the system yet. All we have is the conceptual stuff in our head, empirical stuff in the world. Okay okay so what was that? Explain that metaphysism, metaphysics dichotomy again with respect to what you just said. I'm not sure I followed that. Metaphysics is, I haven't explained that at all yet. That's just, I was just okay. putting that in because it's part of my system, okay. but it's not really relevant to this conversation. It's why. about like absolute certainty and how to differentiate between the fundamental nature of reality as opposed to the next step in reality. It's, it's not part of the conversation necessarily. So all we need right now is, mm -hmm. is like, there's the imaginary stuff in our head and there's the stuff that exists in the world. And if which one you're claiming the God isn't just something in our head, it's something in the world. So well, you need okay, well, some well, let me way. Let stop you there for a second because I'm not sure I'm saying that because I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to understand exactly what your vocabulary implies. Okay. So I'm not sure I'm saying God is in the world as you just described it because if the world is just the empirical No, 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 that, that doesn't matter. So it's, okay, sure. is, is God just something we've imagined and made up and doesn't exist? Is anything other than our imagination? Yes or no? So I would say no. Okay, but so I you're saying it's in the world. That's all that matters. Yeah. That's, that's, okay, so if it's not this, be, then no. it's one of those things. Okay, so I guess that would be a breakdown because I don't think it, it, if it's not imaginary, therefore it's not it's not real other than existing in the world. I guess that would be our breakdown. Well, no, existing in the world just means not imaginary. That's all it means. That's well, I, I wouldn't accept that dichotomy. That would be our difference. Mm -hmm. So existing in our heads is, is somehow being just like an, if something fictional would that we would say doesn't have any real description to it. I wouldn't include as merely being a part of the empirical world. Like I, that what? just wouldn't be, I, I don't even think the average theist would believe that. Like that's just. No, no, no. Way. I never said anything about the empirical world. I, nothing about that. So there's, there's reality well, and there's imaginary. Reality. Imagination isn't reality. If I imagine me, a unicorn, there isn't one in reality. Imaginary me, me means sure not reality. Right. Let me make sure I represent you right. Did you say that what is in the real world, you use the word the world, we can only know empirically. No, no, no. That's, okay, that's okay. never what I said. So, so okay, I just said, sure I, if it's imaginary, good. it's not real. Unicorns okay. are imaginary. They are not real. 
So there if you want to say there's a in the world. No, 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 no. Stop, okay. stop. If it's in the world, it's real. That's that's it. Okay. I never. Not, this has nothing to do with empiricism. This has nothing to do with sure. physics. This is just there is the imaginary stuff and there is the real stuff in the world, and those are the only two categories of things. Uh, uh, sorry if you hear typing. I'm going to write some of these down so I don't keep forgetting yeah, them. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. I do that all the time. I'm typing right now. So, yeah. so, so this is this is just oh, a very, very basic distinction. Last, repeat that last. There statement. is the imaginary stuff in our head which isn't real, and there is the real stuff in the world which is real. That's just, there's the imaginary stuff, not real. You said world, if it's in the world, it is real? You said that? That's just the definition. Anything that isn't only imaginary is real. So if God exists not outside of our imagination, he's real. doesn't matter how hey, he exists. I, I have a question. Is there something that's real that doesn't exist in the world? Or are these just synonyms? That, no, no, the, the reality. It's just reality. So there's the imaginary stuff that doesn't exist in reality, and there's the stuff that does exist in reality. Okay, okay. So when you use the word the world a few times, what well, is reality that? is just synonymous with reality. These are synonyms. Okay, yes. okay. So can okay. we know things in the world or what's real? I think you said no. Let me make sure. Without empiricism. Possibly. You just need okay. some way. To, the only thing you need to know about something in the world is a way to differentiate is it imaginary and is it real? Any method that you can do that works. So empiricism is the method I use, but if any method that can differentiate between okay. those two works. So so any okay hold on so any method that can let you distinguish between imaginary and real it's not just the empirical world whatever we're calling yeah, that. yeah no, that's just it one works. that's just one method sure. okay is it po is it possible in your framework here that there are things that that the, this empirical method is limited and then there are other Absolutely. things that can be known and are real without the empirical method yeah you just have to provide a different method okay so how would you determine whether these are successful i have no idea you don't it's up to you in the method well, see, I, right there, and, and I'm kind of glad we got to this point, because this is ultimately where I, I would want to get, is I think that's just where the fundamental difference between the theist and the atheist is, is that they, they have a, um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but at least for me, and I, as far as I can tell with theism, is they're, um, what they're going to consider successful for themselves. And I think this is probably just true of people. I don't want to charge anyone individually, because I think, especially when we're talking like this in this kind of context, we try to be as objective as we can, but a lot of times it's going to come down to someone's like preference on what they want. So whether they find it successful or not, whether it right, conforms right, to the right. So, so a, theist, a theist has a different criterion for differentiating imaginary from real, and they think that their criterion can indicate a God. Yes. Yeah, okay. And well, further from that, um, I, what I'm going to say, and I, I think some theists will disagree with this, but I think largely, I think they'll agree with me, at least Christians tend, tend to, is that that's not, that conditions that they have aren't going to be compelling to some, to just generally everybody. Like right. it's not going to be. That's fine. That doesn't need to be. I don't care about that either. Okay. Um, well, so from there, um, I, I'm obviously under no illusions that I'm going to be able to like, persuade you out of no, no, Persuasion does not matter. I don't care about persuasion. You don't need to yep. persuade me. That's not what I'm asking. I'm just asking, what do you think can differentiate between God being imaginary and real? That's all I'm asking. It doesn't need to be persuasive. It doesn't need to persuade everybody. Just That's, that's, just, that's well, the I, only question. I, I'm not, a lot of the time, whether or not I think, I, when you say what would di di distinguish God being imaginary from real, um, well, it's going to depend on who I ask. Like, if I ask you, I don't know if what I'm going to say will will meet that standard. Well, no, but... no, no, no. Again, so that's so that's that's not whether it meets my standard is irrelevant. You could be talking to a computer right now and just have it on the screen. How do you differentiate God from being imaginary and real? And you'd have to present your answers. I am irrelevant. No matter who you're talking to, it's irrelevant. Your arguments are true or false on their own, independent of any people at all. So yes, but someone's assessing whether they're true or false. There's always going to be a person at the end of the day, and like even if it's a computer, someone told the computer how to do it. So no, no, no. Well, so I'm, people I'm, are I'm, people I'm, are irrelevant here. People, this is the part that doesn't matter. No, no yeah, one you're talking to matters here. All that matters is is you believe you have a way to show or to justify the belief that God is a real thing and not an imaginary thing, and then you need to present an argument for this. I, no so one I, who I, you're I, talking to matters here. That's so. My goal would be to show is if I said. I know leprechauns exist because I used a magic eight ball and it told me leprechauns exist. Well, we know that's a bad answer. That magic eight ball can't differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real because you could shake it and again yeah, do we, magic we that way. So yeah, if, I can, if I can show that whatever method you use can't differentiate between what's imaginary and real, then I show your method is false. doesn't matter my standard, doesn't matter your standard, doesn't matter anybody's standard. If I can show your method can't differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real, it doesn't work. It's not evidence. And okay, that's okay. what my approach usually is. So you, I'm going to ask you for a reason. Tell me some way that can differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real. And you're going to present an argument. And I'll say, that argument can't tell the difference. Here's why. So it's not evidence. That's usually my approach in uh, debates. Well, I, 
luckily for me at least um we don't have to get into the idea of a necessary reality because like a lot of times i have to kind of defend that but i think you were right about the, the language barrier but from that like it, it so far as i'm giving my initial reason for believing that what we're describing as a reality as an appropriate use of the words that i used before it, it's just going to be the same arguments i gave before now i it seemed like your response ultimately because we obviously went in a lot of different directions was that it's either just meaning it's not different from what you're describing and i'm just calling it that or i haven't added some extra property that you find appropriate to call to mind am i understanding you right there um sort of so uh, you've said there's a necessary reality i grant it and you call that necessary reality having volition because the first cause is volition and you call anything that has volition the mind so i mean i can call anything that has weight a dog and this cup has weight therefore this cup is a dog but i mean obviously it's not if someone asks me do are you holding a dog i mean i say yes because i define this as a dog obviously it's not what they mean that's not okay, what they're talking okay. about. I, I follow what you're saying. Like, just like when, when you use the word mind in, in a normal like, conversation, people are going to attribute more things to it, especially a human mind. They're going to think a human mind. So I, I mean, we're agreeing with that. But clearly, as far as like we're only empirically acquainted with human minds, people can understand the idea of minds not being human minds. So I think we would agree with that. Like they right. can conceptually understand those things. And what I'm saying is I'm just pushing that. And I think the theists generally, when they talk about God as like, the ultimate mind, as like, you know, whatever they might describe it as, is pushing to the essential property of what they see as being a mind. Without that, it is no longer a mind. Like that, that's all I was describing. And yeah. I think if you push it far enough, anyone, uh, sorry, any theist that you push far enough, that's what they're going to grant the essential concept of God is at the foundation. Right. It's, yeah, it's a mind. That's now that's... They, they'll pile things on top of it and they'll, they'll, they'll start describe, you know, especially since they think God's a mind, they're going to start being more uh right, right, right. i haven't asked for any of that i haven't asked for any of that stuff so because again okay. my distinction is is just the essential property of a mind which is like consciousness essentially why should we believe the ultimate nature of reality has that as opposed to being a cup which does not have that okay okay so we wouldn't say as far as i'm using my words here we wouldn't say that a cup is a first cause of something i right. I, I wouldn't say that i mean maybe you would but yeah, that's not know. the question so the question is does well, it the, the first cause does not need to be conscious I would say no, because it doesn't have that property. The first cause does not need to be conscious. Well, I'm saying that I'm saying that it does. So that's a difference. Yeah, but between why? So why we would go we go that. with its conscious as opposed to it not being conscious? Okay, so what I'm I'm part you I'm, you defining yeah. it that way isn't an answer. Yeah. It doesn't work as an argument. So you just say okay. why give me a reason evidentially. Okay, so if we're just disagreeing on our, our use of words here, then then I guess for your sake, I we wouldn't call it conscious. I, I suppose, but like at that point, it's not really we're not really going anywhere. Well, no, again, I don't, I don't care about, we're just using words. We have to use words in the contemporary way, the way most people understand them. Okay, so what am I missing just, out of consciousness? I, I, see, we tried to go into that. And we we went to the- well, I mean, gravity does not have a mind. This cup does not okay. have a mind. The so universe do do does that? not have a mind. The origin, the necessary thing does not have a mind. I have but a mind. The breakdown that I'm, I'm getting to, I get to anyway, is first causation. Now you're telling me first causation doesn't have to be mind. Right. So what, why? Explain Why would it me. need a mind? Like, well, There's no reason it would need a mind to begin with. So guessing, yeah, why, why like, would this this cup needs a mind? Like, no, it doesn't. Like, so so if, I, if, we're, if we're using the, the, the vocabulary again and you're saying I'm just defining it as a mind, if I'm saying, okay, when I say mind, I mean something that has it's first causation. You say, does this cup have a mind? Well, no. So from there... No, 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 no. no. Again, so you, you cannot use mind. That's, that's off the table. You cannot use mind as first causation. That's not an option because the definition of mind in contemporary society does not mean first causation. It's not okay, what mind what means. We, okay, then add the things, things I'm consciousness. missing. Consciousness. Consciousness means mind. Mind means consciousness. You need a consciousness. If you don't have consciousness, you don't have okay. a mind. Uh, let me write this down for a second. So consciousness, if I'm, I'm remember, consciousness equals experience. Yeah, mind is consciousness. Awareness of, how do you explain it? Awareness of what? Just awareness is fine. Consciousness so equals awareness. awareness. And then what was the, what was after that? We got to the qualia. That, and that's like, it. That's it. We'll just stop there. Consciousness is awareness. Don't well, know what causes sure. it. Don't care what causes it. Consciousness is just any form of awareness. Oh, I'm not saying what causes awareness. I'm saying what is awareness. It's, it's awareness. It's like, it's I awareness. have to know what this means. It's the fact that I'm aware of things, I can see things, I'm aware of things, I can think, those are all kinds of awareness. That's what awareness means. Okay, I, I'm just, this is for my sake, so I'm understanding what you're saying. So, awareness. If Google the word awareness. Well, I'm, in, in, in the way we're discussing here, I mean, you, we can, like, I can Google the word knowledge, and that's not going to get to the... Well, no, I'm using awareness just in the classical definition sense, knowledge or perception of any situation or fact. That's awareness. That's what it is. That's consciousness is that. Okay, and the reason I'm doing this is because I, I think this will help properly understand each other because I'm sure you're not understanding me, I'm not understanding you. So moving on from this uh, awareness, 
So can, um, can it, it, I know you're probably not a sort of actual libertarian free will kind of person, but like going along with these concepts, can something that's not aware have a volition as I've described it? No. No. Okay. So is it a part of being aware to have volitions? No, that would be an extra thing. You can be aware okay. without having volition, but you can't have volition without being aware. Okay. So what would be, can you give me like a, like an example or some understanding? Um, like for example, if someone went through a serious stroke and they have conscious awareness, or they have sensory information about what reality is, but they have no desires, no motivations, no intentions. They're just, they just have the experience of being aware, but no motivation. So, so having information about the, your surroundings and stuff like that. Yeah, knowledge or perception of a situation or fact. I mean, they have perception. But they I mean, have no... like computers can have information. I don't think we'd call computers. Aware. They don't have a perception. Okay, so okay, so what is a perception? Do you want me to Google the word perception for you? Because I'm just that's anytime you ask that, I'm just going to Google the oh, word. Actually, yeah, go ahead because I want to see if this is going to fit. What we're talking about perception, perception, the ability to see, hear, become aware of something through the senses. State of being, process, becoming aware of something through the oh, senses. So it's using the, it's using the word awareness. Yes, to be or be aware. Yes, they're synonyms. Okay, so, so way we're, we're, of we're regarding, aware. understanding, or interpreting something, a mental impression. Intuitive understanding or insight. Okay. Any so, of I those mean, work. Okay. So like that, that's why I wanted to do that because a lot of these like sort of Webster definitions that we use in the common language won't necessarily get to the root concept of what we're referring to here. Like, and no, that is, that is the root concept. Like that's, that's it. I mean, okay. Well, if that's a way what you're of regarding with, understanding or interpreting something, a mental impression. That's fine. No, I mean, yeah, that's totally fine. If that's what you want to go with. But the thing is like when you're using internal language here with, which is Heidegger's problem with being, then you're going to just not advance the point. You're not going to advance the concept past that point. Definitions are all tautological. So if you ask, what is a bachelor? I'm going to say a bachelor is an unmarried man. If you ask, what is an unmarried man? I'm going to say it's a bachelor. That's There's not circular reasoning. That's just tautological. Any definitions just literally mean the same thing. Yeah, eventually you, you will get to that like that foundational point, which is what I mentioned earlier. So no, if, That's if, not a foundational if, point. That's just how language works. If you ask for a definition, it's always going yeah, to be tautological. Language is our ability to communicate our concepts. So I'm talking about the concepts specifically. So right. best we can use our words. So, so the concepts yeah. represent something in reality. And yes. the something in reality for awareness is the thing we're experiencing. That is awareness. It's called qualia. That's, there's no further okay. level. It is that. Now, it could be made, I could further define it and say uh, awareness is a product of biochemical processes in the brain, which is a possibility. Or I could say awareness is a product of dualism where there's okay. a m interaction between idealistic things I got, I got. and things. So the thing, that has, the, thing that ha the thing that is or has qualia is, the, is consciousness, and that's what a mind is. So well, consciousness there, is qualia, and the thing okay. that has qualia so is a mind. Here's, here's the sort of reasoning process, I guess you could say, that the theists at the fundamental level would use, or for theism, is that things um things that have volitions have qualia or experience in our minds and volitions as i've explained it are things that are the first cause of causal no, change so that you don't you don't you're not allowed that okay. that's not allowed that. no what we, okay explain again i can say um the thing that causes the first cause is an apple therefore an apple created the universe like no it doesn't make any sense see i'm not i'm not following i'm really not you so, can okay. you can pick any word you want and say whatever is the first cause is this the first cause is a dog Anything that causes the first cause is by definition dog. What does that tell us about the first cause? Well, I'm just trying to help you understand how the theists are thinking about this. Well, like, I, I am, I'm pretty familiar with how the theists think about it. The problem is, is that your definitions don't tell us anything. They're completely arbitrary. Okay, so let me, let me, let me try again then. So the, the theist sees the volition as a property of a person or of a mind or right. something having qualia. Right. And they, they see how they're understanding that. I mean, I mean, yes, you can disagree with that, but as being a first cause of a causal chain, and they see that as the true description of reality with contingent to necessary. Right. And so they're, they're saying, well, this must be a property of a mind. Like, right, right. I agree. And they're just, that's the point is that they're wrong. Like when they think that the first cause has to be volition, they're wrong. And all I have to do to show that is well, what they demonstrate. It has to be. It's like, that's just what they're calling it. Now, I think... It just breaks down as we're just calling it something different. And I guess that's okay. Well, no, no, no. This, it's point. not calling something different. What you call it is irrelevant. The words don't matter. It is what we are referring to when we use the words. When I refer to something, it is the ontology of the thing. Like if I say it's an apple, the, the connotation of apple isn't just the name I'm labeling it. Apples have qualities. They're physical. They taste sweet. They grow on trees. Do those things, does the first cause have those things? No. So it is not an apple. The first cause is not an apple. Okay. Volition has specific properties. It is a part of consciousness. You need consciousness to have it. So does I, the first cause of consciousness? No. Just like it's not an apple, it's not volition. 
You can call it that if you want, but it has nothing. It tells us nothing. It does not have the properties associated with that word. Okay, okay. So volitions are properties of, of consciousness. So we're, we're, we're agreeing with that. Yeah. So what is the volition for you then? Like when, when you, when you use the word. Property of consciousness. What do you mean? The first okay. cause, there's no volition there at all. First cause is just the first cause. You don't need volition for that. It's just an interaction. It's just a, a cause, a cause, an okay. event, uh, a thing that occurs, occurrence. Like those would all be words that you could use to describe the first cause. Uh, it, volition isn't one of them. Volition okay, is just... What's something you would use? What would be a description of a volition? Not what is it, like what what uh, it, it, it is. It's a property of it. But what is the volition? Not just what is it a property of, but what is a volition? Like what is the description of that? I have a volition to try to explain to you that the first cause is not a volition. That's an example. I mean, what is the, the meaning of a volition? Intentionality. Okay, is intentionality consciousness? No, intentionality requires consciousness, but it doesn't. Okay. it's not the same thing. Okay, good. So I'm okay. So then explain that to me further. So is it synonymous with intentionality or is it, are you describing it as well, being so intentionality and volition are synonyms, just like bachelor okay. and unmarried are synonyms. Okay. So, and so the, but consciousness, you can be conscious without having a volition, just like you can be in a brain dead state where you're aware of reality, but you don't have any desire but, to do anything. But you can't, I think you granted this earlier, but I, I don't want to misrepresent you, but you can't have a volition without being conscious. Right. Okay. All right. So what is the essential property of a volition? Uh, consciousness plus intention yeah, plus some kind of desire. Missing, like if the, if it was missing, it wouldn't be a volition on its own. Like, like what would be desire or motivation of some kind, some kind of purpose. I mean, I know, I know like we're not terminating at something specific. Like I was trying to do. And, and I know like your point is that it's all tautological, but I'm not finding new information. So it, there, there is a function in the mind, okay. and the function is intentional. So it does something. It wants something. It craves something. It has a purpose. All of those things, there is a function there. Now, what we call it doesn't make a difference. The words are irrelevant. That function exists in the mind, and that's volition. Mm, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm just, I'm just not understanding. It's probably my fault, but... Um... I, I, when I try to piece this together, I'm going back in a circle to like consciousness, mind, awareness, experience. I'm, I keep going back to these things. Yeah, um, so consciousness and, is a thing. Consciousness is a function. It exists. And so if you have that function, you are conscious. That function is an existing thing. It doesn't matter what words we use to describe it. Okay. So I, I, I'm, we're probably not making much progress here. So I'll just, I'll end this point with this. I mean, you can ask another question or object to it, but. The way theists, obviously, the majority of theists believe in free will in some sense, especially in individual finite persons and minds. And they, they would apply the same information to human persons. Right. So human persons would be the first cause of their volition in that causal chain of whatever volition effects that produce in the world. Right. I'm familiar with their theory yeah, of yeah. free will. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Now, I mean, you can, you can just reject or deny all that, and that's, that's fine. But what the, the reasoning process is just from that – to say that the, the necessary cause is a first causal chain, so it has the property of the, the consciousness and the mind. There's no connection there. Well, I'm saying, like, if you adopt, which, I mean, you're not, but if you adopt the concept of volition... Well, no, I, I understand that theists want to believe that, but there's no evidence there. If I ask for evidence, show this isn't just an imaginary thing you've made up in your head like a fairy tale, you've got nothing. You've defined it, which is just, again, something in your head... So, so it's not like it's, it's, I'm not offering evidence in that sense, if that's what you're saying. What I'm saying is what we're describing as God is that like I, that. I think that's all. Well, I understand what you're describing as God. But again, my original question was show me, give me a reason to show this is not an imaginary thing and is a real thing. Your definitions are all imaginary. So that doesn't give us a way to differentiate. You okay, just so show. At this point, it's more like me saying that the, the necessary reality, that's the first cause of contingent reality or the, 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 the essential cause of contingent reality, which would also be the first in this sense is what we're believing in. Right. I understand your no. definition, but your definition is an imaginary. Show me a reason to believe that there well, is a consciousness that is real, that is the one that is real. That other language I did, I thought you granted it, but maybe you didn't grant all of it, that there's a necessary reality that's the, the reason and cause that there's contingent reality. Right. I grant that. Okay. No, There's no volition there. You can you can think there is. You can define it. It's not required. That's just imaginary. Okay. So we, okay, we don't even have to use the word volition then, but like that's that's the essential meaning of God. Right, but theism. that tells us nothing. So that could be atheists are sure, right, theists are right. Yeah, I mean... So that's the well, point. That This is what I'm asking is, who is right? Give me a reason to believe the theist is right and the atheist is not right. Well, as he, that break. that's why I haven't been using that language is because at that point, if that's the essential, like just that by itself, 
When you say it doesn't tell you anything, well, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to get information about. No, sure, it doesn't. That by itself. Right. So, er, so we grant there's a necessary thing. It could be a God and the theist is right, or it could be a not God and the atheist is right. And that's the question I'm asking is why should we believe the theist is right? Like, I, I, that dichotomy I'm, I'm not working with because it's not that like this, it could be this or this. It's more like what we, what we're describing as, as being different. You can describe something that's real under a false pretense, obviously. Like I heard, uh, I can't remember who it was, but I heard the analogy of, um, if I, if I say that that man over there drinking a uh, martini is my uncle, but it turns out he wasn't drinking a martini. It was water. Like I'm still referring to the same thing under a false description. Okay. So, like w- when you start adding on other properties that uh, some theists or maybe many theists attribute to being as God, I'm not there yet. I'm just saying that the essential thing that they're referring to as God is this reality that I think we're agreeing exists. But yeah, we agree not... there is a necessary thing. That is not the definition of God yeah, because well, okay. it doesn't yeah, tell us anything. Like if we, we can, there are definitely definitions of God that use that, like pantheism, where there is no consciousness there, and that's fine. But what the question we want to know an answer to is who is right, the atheist or the theist? If it's just an unconscious nature, then the atheist is right. There is no God. If there is a God there that has a mind, then the theist is right. Okay, so, and this is where I got to the point of the theists are seeing that same description that we're referring to exists as conscious. Like, that that's what they see. I mean, they're I just understand that's what they see. I don't care what they see. Give me a reason to believe it. Give me evidence. I don't care what they see. I don't care what they believe. It doesn't matter. Give me evidence. Okay, so that, that that's all I was offering there is like that, that part which you're disagreeing with or saying we can't call it that like that's what that's all they're saying like, i, mean, I know what they're saying i don't care what they're saying the first question i asked at the beginning is give me a reason to believe what they're saying isn't just imaginary made-up fairy tale okay i'm gonna try i'll, I'll try the last time and well, i grant they, there's I, a necessary reality we agree with that give me a reason to believe it has a mind okay so the reason the theist believes it has a mind i don't care no, no, i don't want to know why the theists believe it I want an actual okay. evidence. I don't care what anyone believes. Let's omit that part. The reason it is, let's omit that part. The reason it is, is that it is the first cause of causal chain. That's the Why reason. is the first cause of mind? Because the, the first cause would be the essential property of a volition. Why is like, the first cause a mind? Because it has a volition, which is the, which only minds can have. I, I'm just going to omit the theist belief part because, I mean, that's... The, Okay, okay, so that's, that's why the does the first thing. cause need a volition? Why does the first cause need... No, we're saying the first... Ha, being a first cause is a volition. volition. Again, so you've, you've given me no evidence here. You've just defined it. So that's that's imaginary, that you that's haven't true. given... I can define the first cause as a dog, therefore the universe is a dog. And that is equally as reasonable as what you said. So that does not give me a way to differentiate is it real or is it imaginary, because we can use the same methodology for the okay. first cause as a dog. Okay, I mean, I'm okay with that. I mean, if that's just a word... Like, I'm, no, no, like, I'm saying it's literally a physical dog. It's literally a physical dog caused the universe. The first cause is, by definition, a physical dog. What's a physical dog? Like an Airedale, a Boxer, a, a Doberman, physical dog. Like literally a physical dog. I can say the first cause of the universe is, by definition, a literal physical dog. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going with it. So a physical dog, and what, what's the essential property of a dog? No idea. It's, it's just, I'm just saying just literally oh, or a cup. Well, I, I can mean, say a cup. Yeah, any the, any object. I can just pick anything. The The first cause is a cup. By definition. The first cause is a disc. Is okay. this particular cup? Well, I mean, that, that's the that's the interesting point that I'm going. Is like I gave the essential property of what I described. But I want to know what these essential properties are. Now, if it, if it doesn't matter. Essential, if you essential properties them, are just. Up. Essential properties are just descriptions of what the thing is. It's ontology. So this, I don't know what the, I could just, I don't know what the essential property of this cup is. It has one, but whatever that is, this is just, it's made of matter. It's electromagnetism holds it together, whatever you want. Just literally this cup is by definition, the first cause of the universe. Clearly that's stupid. Okay. This cup is obviously not the first cause of the universe. There are essential properties of the cup that aren't true about what we are agreeing on. Essential properties don't make a difference here. So it's not about the essential properties. It's that we can say, we can define whatever we want as being the first cause of the universe. I can say a square circle is by definition the first cause of the universe. Is that evidence? No. I mean, you don't have to call it evidence, but what I'm saying is the, the point that we're agreeing on, which is obviously you can use whatever word you want, 
is that the concept no, no, of not, mind, not words. So this ontology. So you can describe whatever essential properties you want. Essential property of blah, 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 square circle or cup or physical process or essential property of apple. Any essential properties you want, you can just make up essential properties, give it a list, give it a name, and say this is by definition the first cause. Okay, so I make, let's make sure I'm following. The, the difference that you're saying isn't there, that I think is there, is that when you're using these other things and you're saying that we can just call it this, you're also uh, b still believing about these other things, concepts that I'm not believing about that thing if you're using it to describe the, the first cause. Like I, that, I, I don't see how that's following from what you're saying. I really don't. Anybody can make up what they want and call it the first cause. It doesn't mean it is. So when, when, I, when I said that a volition, which you're saying has other things to it, is essential the essential property of it is not those things that's not how we're understanding it when we when i said we were acquainted with ourselves as persons that it is the first cause of a causal chain it terminates at the volition or at the will or whatever you want to call it go ahead i i, I thought you were going to say something yeah yeah i was that that, that was the that we're, we're agreeing that the necessary reality it isn't preceded by some other causal effects so it's the first Okay, so that that's that that's it. Yes, I mean, yes, not, and we that's yeah, we can right. agree on all of that, except okay. none of that indicates the word volition doesn't apply there. It's just again, you could just replace it with any word a, like a, just a proposition in logic. Just give it with a. It tells us nothing about a. Okay, so when I okay, so let's 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 take the word volitions and stuff out for a second. So just replace it with a. So there is something that caused. There is a necessary thing that caused the beginning of the universe, where it's going to be a. Okay, so so from from here, I'm I'm not super worried about semantics at, th at this exact moment because from here, even though I, I think earlier in the in the talk you mentioned that a lot of people do, it's just a description problem. That's important because in the conversations, this part that we're agreeing on isn't isn't agreed on explicitly, and kind of the the, the reason I've been using the idea of like this is what they call it, this is the, the this is how they understand the concept, is that I think this fundamentally is agreed upon, and it in advancing the conversation because insofar as it's a debate and people have fun with the debates and it's like atheism or theism on these like like macro scale ideas that you and you get like christianity and then you know naturalism or whatever i think there's a lot more agreement on this basic premise and well, I yeah, think they, that... they all agree on there is a necessary thing which is reality we, well, we yeah, all agree reality exists I know, but but the contents of that, I think we also agree on to a pretty large extent that isn't explicit in the conversation. No, so it is. It is. The problem is the, the next step. So we all agree reality exists. We all agree we can call it a necessary thing and that there's a contingent reality and that the contingent reality falls from a necessary thing. Everybody agrees with that, 100%. We, just, we call it different things. The quest, No one cares about that question. No one even asks about that question because we all agree with it. The part we care about is, does reality have a mind? Does it have a name? Can we talk to it? Does it have a consciousness? Those are the things we care about. Now, what you mean by those terms is irrelevant. We're talking about what classical people mean by those terms. Does it have a mind? Does it have, can it speak? Can we talk to it? Can it answer prayers? It yeah, doesn't so make a difference. Getting on those, adding those properties on is, is further steps that I, I haven't. That, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not the further steps. Those are the only first steps. If you're not asking those questions, you're not talking about what theists and atheists are talking about. Like we've already agreed to the necessary reality. We, we agree there is reality. We don't care about that question. That that question is not entailed in the debate. The only part of the debate is, does it have a mind as we, as most human beings understand the word to mean, or does it not, and it's just a cup? Okay. That's the only part of the debate. No, I have, I have, I think that's a good segue to the next point. Now, how much longer do you want to go before I start getting into it? Because I don't know if you Go want for to... it, go for it, I don't care. Okay, okay cool. So, so in terms of our use of the language and what we consider volitions or not, let's not use those words, but let's take one of the, Let's take a... We'll, you, no, use logical. X, Y, Z, A, B, C, just any logical proposition. P is this. Okay, well, that we I tried to do that, but I didn't really get us anywhere. No, you didn't, no, so there's a necessary thing. The necessary thing caused reality. We're going to call the necessary thing P. Okay, that's fine. There's no, there's no error in that. Go with that P. There is P. Okay, there's P, but what I'm saying is P has properties that I believe I, that I'm calling something that you're not because you think that. What are the properties? Name so a property. Consciousness, whatever you want, what we talked about before. Okay, and why? Properties, those properties, you're including things into it that right now I'm not because I'm going to get to that. But 
when I'm including these things, I gave you their their definitions, their central concept, or their sorry, their essential properties. Well, again, essential properties don't matter here. So you're saying that P has consciousness. I'm saying P does not have consciousness. Demonstrate P as consciousness. Okay. When when I when I said I demonstrate P as consciousness, I explained the the first causation like that. That no, is, all you did was gave a definition. So P is P. That's all you said is P is P. Just like I just just like I said, consciousness is awareness. P is P. You say what's the evidence that P is consciousness? I say it was the first cause. You say that's not evidence because first causes aren't consciousness. Like like like. So so, so no no. So you're saying that there is an additional pro property to P. P isn't just the origin of the universe. It also has consciousness. If it's just the origin or the first cause, if P is just the first cause, that's it. Full stop. You can add nothing else. Then you're okay. saying P well, is well, conscious. Right if P is just the first cause of the universe, it has nothing else. You can say nothing else about it. That's all we can say about it so far. That's the only property we've added in right now. Why? That's how definitions work. So P is by definition the first cause. Then the first cause is by definition P. P is by definition the first. That's how P definitions work. Definition. No, no. P is by definition necessary reality, right? The necessary reality is the first cause. Yeah, those right? are the same thing. Those, those will all be P. Those are all the oh, same thing. Oh, okay. Well, so that might be a disagreement. So, so a first cause is has to be necessary. We, we, yes, let's grant that first of all first. Okay, I'm not. I, I, I'm not granting that. That's what I'm saying. I was trying to make sure I'm understanding what you said. Okay. So, so there is a necessary reality. It yes. created the first cause, and that's P. Yes. Okay. Nowhere in that statement does consciousness exist. Consciousness okay. is not one of the premises in that statement. So, sh okay, sure, but we're saying that that's synonymous with a consciousness. If, if you say that's synonymous with consciousness, you're just saying P is P. So you've still added nothing well, in there to give me cause, a belief consciousness. So being a first cause is not synonymous or, nor entails necessity. It, it's in, in this concept so far because you said sure. So it doesn't in, in, entail necessity. So we have other reasons to think it's necessary that we're agreeing on. Okay. So it's necessary and now this is an extra step. It's the first cause. So those aren't synonymous. Unless okay. you want to say they are, then we're going to have to rewind. And no, no, that's fine. We can say there's okay. necessary in the first. Yeah, okay. Those, those, that's P. Okay. It's necessary in the first right. cause. Two separate properties. I, uh, I would be P. talking about this, but I'm also trying to think, and I'm not very good at that. So thinking and typing at the same time, it sounds weird, but thinking about different things. So so with that, we're saying that if, it, if it's a first cause, the only thing, as far as we're describing here, that that's first causes are minds. No, that's, that, that's, that's never that's in there. there. Oh, well, that's what that's what I'm that's what that's our evidence we're offering. So we're saying evidence. Wait, 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 which part? There was no evidence there. All you just said was define it. You said P is P. No, P is necessary. Yes. Here, um, P is the, the necessary first cause. It's necessary. P has a property, right? Which we have independent reasons for believing. So we, we have an independent reason for believing P exists. Then we have in, uh, reasons separate from that for believing that P is the first cause because they're not synonymous. So, so, so again, stop, stop, stop. P is the necessary and P is the first cause. It has these two properties. Neither of those entail consciousness. So why are where is the consciousness? Okay, okay. Let, let, let me let me go from there. So P is necessary. So it's not that it has a property. Well, I mean, sure, I guess we. Does yeah? P is necessary, and P is the first cause. It has those two properties. Whatever this okay, is, okay. how propositions so, work. I'm giving an if conditional. So if P is first cause, P has consciousness. That's what. That's my next step. Now you can just disagree with that. We can talk about it. Again, that, that's just P. That's just definitional. Anything that is definitional is just imaginary, so that doesn't work. If P is if P is the first cause, then P is a dog. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let me let me try to say it a different way then. So if it's if it ends up being true, but uh, you don't have to necessarily grant it yourself. But if it ends up being true in this regime we're we're imagining right now, if it's the case that have being a first cause is, is identical with a volition, and we agreed earlier that volition is only a property of minds. What what's the problem that you have with what I just said? Well, no. If the first cause is necessarily volitional, then you would be correct. It's just, but I can okay. say if the first cause is, is a dog, then I would be correct. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So, so that's the point is that you haven't given any evidence here because all of that's still imaginary. You need to show. Well, I'm, saying, I'm saying that if you grant what I said, which I mean you're not going to, but if you grant what I said, then yes, I'm not granting the dog part. So I, right, but I'm granting this. Right, right. So that's the thing is that you haven't provided any evidence just like I haven't. So you want to define the first cause as necessarily being volitional. Well, I, I, okay. I'm not, it's not that I'm not granting what you said because you didn't have evidence. I'm just not like, I'm not granting what you said because I don't think it's meaningfully different. Or if it is meaningfully different, then you're not going to imply what you just said. It's like, you're just not going to have it both ways. What? No, I'm, I'm literally saying a physical dog is by definition the first cause of the universe and only a physical yeah, but, dog. I mean, if, if I press you on it, you're going to reduce the properties of this to just to describe the same thing I am. So no, no, just... I'm, no, I'm just, I'm literally not going to do anything. I'm saying it's literally a physical dog and that is it. 
So go I mean, ahead and try and press me and try and get me rid okay, of it. Let's, let's go down this route then. Go so what it. is physical dog? Physical dog. Okay, I mean, give me the essential properties of physical like dog. DNA, cells. So it's made of atoms, right? Yeah. It's made of atoms, right? Yep. Did, did this cause all atoms? Yep. Okay. So explain to me what that would imply. No about... idea. I don't care. It's just a physical dog. I'm just defining it to be this way. Okay. I mean, sure. I mean, I can go with that. Well, that's the point. So, so I presented no evidence here. What you're doing is you're going down a route and saying, so now we have a reason to believe that there's going to be a mind because a mind can do these things, whereas atoms can't. That would be evidence. Defining it isn't evidence because I can define it as so a dog. Maybe, if I understand your question, maybe your question is why should I think that minds only, only minds can be first caused? Right. Yes. I mean, why? This, oh, we already went down that section, but I'm no, gonna try to get because I probably got lost in the intermediary conversation. Because I'm gonna clip this video and show where I tried to do that, but okay. I'm, I'm gonna try again. Okay. So I'm gonna try to rewind all the thoughts. So why think? the mind has this first causation because I'm, I'm understanding first causation as being a volition. So if you're asking me why I think that's a volition, that is the essential concept to us. And the reason we think that is because our fundamental, when we broke down consciousness, awareness, equalia, we experienced that in ourselves. So we, we were able to recognize that we have volitions in a sense that we're minds and that other things that don't have this, this phenomena does not. And so we recognize that terminating with us, now, I know you're going to disagree with this because you're going to break it down into physics point. But in, in terms of this, I guess, regime I'm explaining, we're able to recognize that about the other part we already agree with, which is the necessary reality. That's the first cause. So that's the reason we're saying, okay, I experienced this. I know I'm having volitions in this quality sense, in this properly basic sense. And I, it terminates with me at the first cause as far as we're understanding first causation, which maybe that's what we have to get into. And then we're just we're seeing that here. So that this essential property, we see that there. Like you don't necessarily have to see that all the like, it's not like everyone will say, okay, there is a first cause to everything. Cause I don't think that's immediately obvious until you break it down and explain it. So when we say, okay, now that I realize that's the case, I can infer from there, from what I just explained logically, that it's also conscious like I am, but the, the details of that, we can also, for other reasons that we've already went over a little bit, that it might not necessarily have the same, all the same other macro properties I have. So, so again, so your argument, a lot of the same stuff already. Your argument is that we have first causes in our brain from free will or whatever, and we know the universe is a first cause. Therefore, we can conclude that the universe has a conscious mind. Yeah, okay, I'll try to put it in some premises. Sure. So, um, I mean, so the 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 thing I just described about us would be an evidence for a premise. It wouldn't really be a premise. So I'll give you the premises, and then we can go over like the the individual reasons to believe the premises right so uh, i guess first premise and i'm just i'm thinking of this off the spot so it might not sound as um precise as it probably would be if i sat down and wrote it out but premise one would be um first causations are volitions no no no. that's that's a crap so so start with this it seems like this okay. we yeah, you... have we premise one we have first causes in our volitions or minds or whatever oh, let me, let me so you're probably right i just might have a better way to word it so premise one is we we have we have volitions which we experience as first causes within our minds sure. no, yeah. that's two premises so we have first causes in our minds we have are we our volitions so we have volitions we have volitions we have volitions, we volitions as being for yeah we, we can separate those into two premises sure so we have volitions premise one Premise two, we have, we experience volitions. Our as being volitions are our first causes. Our volitions are first causes. Well, that might be a different premise. So what I said, you can tell me why you might not like this. But you said that, volitions and first causes are synonymous. Anything that has a volition is a first cause, right? Yeah, yeah, we can go with that. So it's volitions are first causes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's just go with that. That sounds simpler. Okay. So and then the universe. The un or reality or whatever the universe has a first cause. Okay. Conclusion: the universe has a mind or a volition. No, the the universe was caused by a volition. Okay. So so, are you going to object to like equivocation or what? Are you going to try to object to here? I just wrote it down. I'm thinking about it. Okay. Okay. So we have volitions. Volitions are first causes. Okay. The first thing is no volitions are not first causes. So that would be. I would grant premise one, reject premise two. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's kind of where we've been at. Um, 
premise three, the universe has I can grant. Well, no, I would actually, because premise three would be, even if the universe has a first cause, reality doesn't. So the universe began at the Big Bang. That's granted, but or, reality doesn't have a first cause because like reality caused by something like the, the the temporal nature of it. We don't really have to get right. Into. Right. Well, no. So I'm thinking like there is a necessary thing. Mm-hmm. The necessary thing doesn't have a first cause. Right. So, so we're on the same page there. And the necessary thing caused all the other stuff, which means it doesn't actually need to be a mind. Well, okay, okay. Well, I didn't say it caused all the other stuff. I know I was saying that. The contingent it, stuff, whatever. Yeah. It, well, it's the cause of the the sort of the, the sort of macro contingent. The conti- yeah, not the necessary thing is the cause of the contingent. So I'm not going to say. Obviously, I wouldn't say that it caused other volitions because that wouldn't that be contradiction. So let me see if I can try to show you why this does not work at all. Um, and and if, if at any point, if we don't finish and you're still in the middle of doing that, you can also, also send me a written critique and we, if we want to do a follow-up later. Because I know we're, we're going on kind of long here. So I can say dogs have fur. Fur are the first causes. The universe has a first cause. Therefore, the universe is made of fur. Okay, is that your critique? Because I'll I can... Yeah, essentially, it's the same thing. I mean, we can take premise two just and premise one, just change it to anything we want and say, okay... We can literally change them to anything we want. Okay. I mean, again, that, that comes down to this, like we're just using different words. No, no, no. no. So the, the, the words don't matter. It's the ontology. I'm saying there is a different ontological thing. Like we have volitions, dogs have fur. Yeah, you're, those you're are two volitions in, a, in a... No, 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 no. I'm granting your definition of volitions. I don't, I'm just, I'm, you can just pick sure. any other thing you want. Like if I said dogs are cats. Okay. No, this is, I'm not saying that, I'm not using the words here. I'm literally saying a dog is a cat clearly that's false it doesn't work dogs are not cats but i'm not but i can say it i can put the words next to one another right okay is is the is the point that volitions aren't first causes is that where you're going with this uh sort of so i'm saying that when we list i'm understanding so so i'm saying that when we list these things like when we list volitions are first causes like Mm -hmm. prove it prove it okay so if i'm saying like the the, the definition of a volition for you want me to prove no, that? De- anything if you involve definitions doesn't work so it can't be the definition well, you got to so prove it what, what, i guess what you're asking me to prove is it first causes yep i'm saying that okay well okay. No, no no not first causes i can grant first causes but you have to prove volition is a first cause i mean so if i'm defining it that way that, that that's right, that's not evidence like, i can define a dog as a first cause there's no evidence yeah, it's like asking me to define a bachelor's not married like it doesn't make sense well, no, no no i mean like i can say a bachelor is a married man I can, I can define a bachelor as a married man but that doesn't work. So you can define it any way you want. The point is, is that you have to show that your definition corresponds to reality and isn't just made up in your head. That's what I'm asking. Show that your definition isn't just made up in your head and corresponds to reality. First causes are things that exist in reality. Volitions yes. are things that exist in our head. So you have to show that this, well, see, these two, there's a connection here. Yeah, They're not but, just like, made up. That's not what I. That's not what I'm saying. Volitions are though. So we're just having. No, 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 no. I, I understand. I understand what you're saying. That's not the point. So you are claiming volitions are first causes. First causes exist like dogs. They are a thing in reality. They are not just made up in our head, right? As we grant the universe or reality has a first cause or the contingent reality has a first cause. So what exists in reality? It's not just in our imagination. Now you have to show that volitions are those things. If you can't do okay. it, you have no, no evidence. So just your, description them doesn't there, work. Not, your description there, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going with. So when you say first causes are things out in reality, yeah. like, like a dog is, I'm, that, that's not what Again, I Again, mean. physical reality doesn't matter here. We're just saying it's not imaginary. Is it imaginary? It, it, whether it exists in reality, first causes are just descriptions of things that happen. So like causes, as we're describing them, causes, whether they're physical or not, are real things in reality. And the first causes would just be that first thing that happens. And what I'm saying is like okay. that that production or that thing would be a volition. That, that's when I... Right, when right. I, and right. that's what I'm saying. Demonstrate it. So there was a first cause that exists in reality. Well, not, you know there was a first that. cause. I'm not saying... It's not like it's a claim of an extra property because I'm, I'm really not trying to say that. I'm not trying to say that there's some extra part to this first cause called a volition. Like this whole time, I'm not, I've, I haven't been trying to do that. I'm saying is what, when we arrive at volitions as being a thing oh. in reality, which is a part of our experience, the qualia. Yes, you are. Because you're saying volitions require minds. Like we have volitions and yes. you're saying volitions require minds. But the first yes, cause so Our, our belief that volitions are our are, are first causes is the properly basic belief that we do it ourselves. Probably basic. Be- or or no, quality. No. 
we, we no we, no because again right. volitions and minds are not the same thing i didn't say i didn't say they were the same so, thing i'm saying so like, that can't uh, that's not how properly right. basic works but again so the fact that we have minds and we have volitions and we're going to call that a first cause of some kind we does not necessarily mean the universe's first cause is caused by minds. It's a composition division fallacy. Yeah, I want to make sure I heard you right. It's like, um, I can push stuff over. That cup fell over, therefore it was pushed by a person. Clearly not. It could have been pushed by the wind. Right? No, I mean, say the words you just said again. I, I, I don't I remember what the words I said again. So, so the, uh, if I knock over a cup and say, oh, cool, look, look, I knocked over a cup. And then we see a cup knocked over, like, oh, that must have been done by a person. Clearly, that doesn't work because there's lots of other things that could knock over the cup. So if we want to say our volitions are first causes and the universe caused the first cause, therefore a mind did it, clearly not the case. Well, the steps there that you're doing isn't representing what I said very well. And that's probably, that might be my fault. But the, the point is that the reason we believe, so obviously we're, we're experiencing ourselves. And this is that what I said, the properly basic thing. We, we just have the immediate experience of ourselves existing and having well, it's, it's consciousness. Not, it's not what properly basic means, but okay. Okay, then, but do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So we okay, experience, sure. we we experience ourselves. So, yeah, we experience ourselves and we believe the truth of these experiences, not based on some other fundamental evidence, but because of the experience. Right. right? Are you following that? Yeah. That, that's what I meant yes. by properly basic, but if you're saying there's more, I mean, we don't have to call it that, whatever. But that is where I'm deriving the concept of volitions being first causes. Right, right. I got that part. Okay. All right. So, so from that, so we've got volitions being first causes. Sure. Stops at us. We see that there's a first cause to like the contingent universe. Are you, are you following me so far? Yep. Okay. So you have any objections so far? Yes, but keep going. Okay. Let's go back. No, only this matters because I, I, I think it's a communication problem. So, so you, you claim that our experience is a first cause. Prove it. Because you can't just say it. You can't call it properly basic. I can call anything properly basic I want because it's pretty arbitrary and doesn't work. But that's not evidence. Okay. Okay. Let me start over. So the experience of ourselves. Are you asking me to prove that? No. I grant that part. We have experience. Okay, grant that part. So I'm saying grant the, the, it's, that experience. Grant it's a first cause. What, what I'm you... saying that experience. We're experiencing that in recognizing the, the description of what a first cause is, which you said well, that, we that's the part. No, there. that's the part. No. So the description okay. of what a first cause is in our experience, there's no connection there. Where, where's the connection there? Okay. I'll, so if, if we're just, we're, we're brushing over a few things, I think it's probably a good idea. Like, like necessary reality and first causation. We're going to, we're, we're assuming we're agreeing with these concepts. So when I say we're experiencing ourselves and we're experiencing that we exist, we, we have that the world exists or whatever. Agreed and our, our will, our consciousness it's a part of that. Yep. We're saying that we're recognizing that reality. We, as the people that are believing this, are recognizing that reality as stopping with us. That's what we mean by when we say it's it's a first causation with us. What? That doesn't so, make any sense. Okay, let me, let me try to use other words. So the experience that is like the fundamental, that doesn't have like further proofs or other things that prove it true other than us experiencing it, the, the volition or the, the conscious will is a part of that. And the first causation concept that we haven't explicitly defined yet because we thought we assumed we agreed on it is what we're experiencing. We're recognizing that concept is a part of that experience. Well, I agree first causes for the universe, but when you say a first cause in a mind, there's no connection to those two things. Oh, right? Well, I'm getting to that for a second. So what I just said, what I just said, do you have a problem with that? Yeah, there's, there's, you, you've made no connection between a first cause and a mind. You have, we have experience. Yes. Well, no, I mean, I mean. Can, what, what I the words I just said? Maybe I'll try to say it again. I'm trying to see if you're having a problem with what I just said. So the, we have the fundamental experience of ourselves and yep. everything, and uh, us being conscious, having a will, being person or whatever, having a mind is a part of that. Yep. And recognizing that the first causation concept. What? You want me to find? You want to go into that? Is that? I, I have no idea what you're saying. Recognizing that the first. Wait, wait, okay, what, well, what, so, so, so yes, we I exist. Did, we have okay. minds. Rec what? what is it, where, how does this I'm fit saying, into the premises? Okay, then I'm saying we're recognizing that this is the evidence for why I think this is what it is. Uh, that experience, we're able to infer from that experience that that experience is a first cause. We, we, can, I, I, can, I can recognize that, that experience is a, is a square circle. Like what? That doesn't make any okay, sense. Are you, are you having trouble with my concept of first causation? Do we want to go how, that? how does it relate to a mind? Like I can say, okay, we have experience. We have no, no, mind. We, we, we already, uh, us being a mind is a fundamental belief so that's not like right that's not the inference the inference right. is that 
what is what that, is how does that a first cause? How does that in any way relate to anything that is a first cause? So the the what I'm saying is the we're experiencing our wills as be, fitting the description of what is true about a first cause. That's Which what is I'm what? Saying. Okay, so we, we need to get in first cause. I think that, like that's where we're not making progress. So what do you understand a first cause to be? The first cause. I the, mean, the cause I mean, that was if, first. If someone, if someone didn't have any understand, like they're just like, I don't, I don't know what that is, like, like completely at all, without using the same words, in the internal language, like, how would you try best explain it to them? Um, I would say, the origin of space and time. Yeah, I mean, do you really think that would help? Like, I mean, if it's just being honest, like, okay, maybe I need to ask it another way. So I think we we agree that it's the first of the causes, and it maybe. In, in trying to gather the words for explaining the the, the self experience. Yeah, so so like from my perspective, that we begin the causal chain of the volition to will so, or whatever. So from my perspective, there can only be one first cause. There cannot be a class of first causes. There is only one first cause, and it is the cause okay, okay. for all so, other possible causes. I, I see what you're saying with that, and I I mentioned earlier that we, we disagreed on that, but in our concept of the free will, obviously. But the when I say first, I don't mean first above literally everything. We're talking about a specific causal chain. So, and obviously that, that evokes other macro effects, but I'm talking specifically in, in the libertarian free will model uh, that I, I, I know you don't agree with, but um, individual agents, even that aren't God, have separate wills from God, obviously, or from the ultimate reality. Okay. And th those free wills are, we're defining it that way specifically as the wills are first causes of causal change from that agent that's not God. Or other agents. Okay, that so when they say first cause, you said it doesn't help. Okay, hold on. So when we say first so, cause, so like if I like I said this way, suppose there's a row of dominoes and I knock them over, then six dominoes. We go six dominoes down. We're going to start at this domino. This domino is the first cause of the next domino. Even though okay, it's the okay. Sixth so domino. so if we want to use a more simplified version, yeah, let's let's use dominoes. So if, if I have a domino, the first domino in this con in this analogy would be the first cause. Sure. So the first domino would be the first cause, but you have just different rows of dominoes with first dominoes right. that there aren't connected. Right. Does that, does that help a little bit in what I'm trying to explain? Well, no, no. The question is, is that when you say we have a first cause, okay, okay. Like, well, so no, we there, were caused by other things. Like everything so about could, us was caused by other things. You could say we are either the first or one of the rows of the dominoes, right? So we're just one of yeah. several domino rows. And right. the, the experiential evidence that I was trying to grant was that we have an experience that our volitions and what we're experiencing that as being whether you want to call it properly basic or not is well, that's, we're that's the question the that that's the question our first dominoing i guess you could say in effect how how do you get to the point that our experience is a first dominoing so that that point if i'm understanding your question right that point was the immediate experience evidence. you can't like, immediate experience your first domino you can only immediately experience the dominoes after you well, I think we can. I think How like so? we, we can experience the fact that we are the first initial point of our will. I think that that we we have a sort of okay. How, how so? That's that's the evidence I'm asking for. How do you? Do well, that? I mean, the same way we would have any essential uh, experience, experiential belief, the same way we'd experience sense data or whatever or the past. Like I think we just experience it. We don't have some sort of outside of that verification method. We just ex immediately experience it, and that's what I refer to as properly basic. But how, how many numbers am I holding up? Well, I'm two. You can see me. Okay, now do that for free will. Go. Okay, well, I mean, it's it's no more different than the fact that... You um, said it was I, just like all the other ones. I just demonstrated one. Go. Come yeah, on. Yeah, so but when, when I say I can see it, that that's a like sort of, I guess you call it a macrocosm of other phenomenon that's going back to just an immediate experience of those things. Like, I'm experiencing sight. So right. when I say I see it, right. it the, the, the seeing is a description of a larger scale thing that i am just experiencing so i'm experiencing the two right right Same so the question is is how do we experience free will because i don't experience any free will well, i didn't say you did i mean that, that's another thing is um not everyone experiences seeing two things and sure yeah you can explain that specific example of problems with the sense data but that's still true about them not having experience they, they could have no concept of what it means to see two things right so we can tell the difference we can demonstrate some people have vision and some people don't but yeah, in that example, free will, I, I, we I get agree. nothing. We, there's no evidence of free will. You're just saying that we experience it, but we don't. Okay, well, so now here's where I think you could have a good objection, is that the the sort of model, I guess, that most people use in, a, in the layman's terms of this whole properly basic justification is that if you have some reason to believe it's false, then it, then you aren't just fine believing it. 
And so here's why I think you could have a good objection, which is that you could give your argument against free will and say, well, since we know that that's not actually a thing, you're not just just by believing it, similar to how you might say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we have reasons to believe that the blind person isn't just by believing that there aren't two things when you hold up two fingers. Um, so I think that's where you could go. Now, that's a whole other conversation, which I'm willing to have. But I'm, I'm granting that there aren't good defeaters for the people who experience um, and properly understood the first domino volition thing. That people experience delusions. That's a defeater. Yeah, but but we're going to agree with this. But the reason that those delusions are the reason there are defeaters that they, they are delusions. That's a conclusion. I'm saying don't exist for free will. I just gave one. People experience delusions, so you can say you experience free will. That's just a delusion. Okay, so delu the fact that an experience is delusion is a conclusion of a defeater. So we have, we have reasons, other reasons, to believe that that what they're experiencing is a delusion. So we're going to agree. Anything with that. you experience could be a delusion, other than your experience itself. Therefore. If you think you think you experience free will, that could be a delusion. So anything you experience could be a delusion other than experience itself. Explain no. that part to me. Um, like, even if I think I don't exist, I still necessarily exist to have the belief. So I must have experience necessarily, no matter what. Anything I'm experiencing, I must have some kind of experience. I can't think I exist and be wrong. Oh, yeah, I agree with the, the, the Cartesian view of... Right. Uh, yeah, free will I, isn't I like that. that. Free will, but, there's nowhere in there. Well, so, I mean, I think it is, but here's how why. So? That's, that's the how so, so, yeah. So when you hold up the two fingers, you're experiencing that total perception where, you know, we, we can describe the macro levels of light and vision, whatever. But the ultimate experience itself is justified to still believe in. Like, you're going to keep believing it because you don't have something else telling you that you shouldn't. So, for example, the blind person that can't see two might have other sense data like ears or hearing. And the, the composite information input they're getting from that, from all the other people that can see things, are telling them that they should be able to and there's something wrong with them. So that composite's a defeater. Okay, but them. there's no experience of so, free will there. So where, where is the experience well, of free will? So I'm saying people, you know, I, I know you don't, but I'm saying that there, there's a claim of experience of free will. Right. Just like there's a, a claim of experience of vision. Right. And the, the people that experience free will are saying that they don't accept the defeaters presented against that experience right, just like the burden of proof l so you have to present evidence for it you can't accept the defeated against it so how do you because well, like it, i for vision or any of the senses i can demonstrate evidence to show those things well not 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 without being circular you can't though that's what yes, i'm saying I can. what do you mean so anything you demonstrate to prove your vision is going to depend upon the essential experience of that anyway just like that okay no how about, no so before i before i proceed what are the differences on what you're understanding as the, the properly basic model that you're saying I'm missing? Well, I because reject the properly basic model completely. So, oh, but because okay, okay. properly, there is no such thing as a properly basic belief. It's completely false. Okay. But that's, so, I don't, that's no, fine. Uh, I mean, you can, sure. I mean, that's another, just, we're going to disagree on that. And we'd have to, we can go down that, which maybe we should. Well, like, like, like most philosophers, I reject Plantinga's entire basis of his epistemology. The reformed epistemology. Yeah. I've, I've kind of figured that but, out now. But that's, so, but that's not, that's irrelevant to the argument here. So, the argument well, the, here is that... So you can reject it, sure, but I mean, that's the justification being presented. Well, then I can just say it's not evidence because clearly it doesn't work. I mean, okay. yeah, that's but, but that's the question is that if all your right. evidence is is that what you're going to claim is properly basic, I can claim uh, green unicorns are properly basic and then I have evidence of green unicorns. So that methodology does not work as evidence because it doesn't differentiate between what's imaginary and what's right. real. And, and just, just for the sake of maybe the conversation in the audience, you're, by evidence you mean reasons to believe, right? Just by belief. Way to differentiate between imaginary and real. But that would be the same thing I said to you? Pretty much. Like, okay, sure. So, yeah, yeah, we're just going to disagree on that. And um, I think there are reasons to not believe what you just said that aren't comparable to what I did. But if what? for whoever's watching, that, that's the difference, I think, is that I, I, you can boil it down to Planticus' reformed epistemology, which I find coherent enough, but... Um, I did, wasn't going to get into his entire like thesis on it, but I think that's what it does boil down to. It's like it's just a different epistemic standard, and we, they they accept properly basic belief as a justified form of believing things that are experienced without what they see as things that defeat it. And from there, if whoever's been watching is can follow everything else that we've kind of gone in is not perfectly straight line, but a, a line is when you compile up up to what I explained. I think that's the essential component of theism, which goes to other things. But I was trying to keep it as concise as I could. Right. So, yeah, we can say that's obviously false because I can claim anything is properly basic. There's no way to differentiate between what's properly basic and what's not. It's a completely arbitrary metric. Green, purple, I mean, unicorns I, are properly basic. 
I think there's ways to di differentiate, but well, that's actually if you just Google Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy properly basic, that's one of the major problems of why most. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying none so, of this is not contentious. It's not like everyone, like I said, it's not compelling. Not everyone's going to believe it, but I do think that th this is the justification provided. I find it persuasive. Me, like, so I'm giving you me, and I right. think I like to think I'm giving you what, if pressed, most theists would say, yes, this is it. There's might not explain it the same way. Right. And so and so I'm saying you're using an imaginary criterion to try and show things aren't imaginary. I mean, so yeah, you mean you can charge with that, but we can charge it with like I can I can charge that against um verification predictions. Well, verification and predictions is imaginary criterion. We are using that imaginary criterion to differentiate because we have a yeah, reference right. point of reality. That's the difference is that you don't have a reference point of reality. We do. Well, so the, the experience, the, the, the person defending the reformed epistemology it clearly says they do because they're experiencing reality. Like that's what they're saying. And so your, your, your experience of reality is verifying a prediction, which is also rooted in experience. And they're saying, yes, that same experience, we have all these other things. And they would probably hold similar. I mean, I'd like to think they probably hold similar falsification criteria, maybe not in all cases, but the falsification criteria used in the sort of the properly basic model would still be there. It just, they're just not, they're saying that there, there isn't one of those for any of the ones that we probably agree are true plus free will. And then for some people, God, God, actually God's actual reality, which I haven't argued for in this video, but. Right. But so again, all I have to do is show that that criterion can't differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real. So if I claim, I mean, I really, I've gone through properly basic a long time. It's been refuted completely because um, I believe it's the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy where they go through and they say, ask Plantinga, what is it that determines what a properly basic belief is? And he said it's cultural. So the cultural belief in voodoo would count as a properly basic belief. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, because it would. Now, we wouldn't believe it because we believe there are defeaters for it, just like you believe there are defeaters well, yeah, for it. Yeah, but that's the point. It's not whether or not you particularly believe it. It's the, can this methodology of assigning properly basic things differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real? And if it can be used to identify an imaginary thing, like voodoo, as a real thing, then we know that criterion doesn't work. Well, when you say we know, I know it, I know you're referring to the people that are holding to this, but that, like your your description at the beginning of like assume there isn't people and just like objectively true or false yes mm -hmm. there are there is objective what? truth or yeah, yeah there's, there's absolutely objective truth so there's objective truth but the, the sure. questions that we're addressing and the way we're addressing it is what are we reasonable what's reasonable to believe is true and so that's the debated point right and we have arguments and evidence like that the point is not like someone somewhere can say this is true and we're asking them it's like we're, we're giving the methodologies on why we come to beliefs that right. clearly people believe and there's clearly quite a few that the parodies try to address that people don't believe and i think there's a video you had uh, i saw part of it about flying spaghetti monster but i didn't want to redo that video and the reasons that we're presenting the, the reason criteria obviously you're, you're not going to agree with it you're going to say when you say we can show i know you believe that that's part of the objective truth just the other people don't and that's why i'm, I'm important it's important when i say i don't think it's compelling and even though there's probably not a single thing, a single proposition that's maybe compelled by everybody, I, I would like to think the Cartesian view of the self is, even if some people say it doesn't. All right, I, I would agree with that. But, but remember, remember my but, remember my example of the the magic eight ball. If I said I believe leprechauns are real because a magic eight ball told me, we can show that's false because the methodology can't differentiate yeah. between what's imaginary and what's real. Yeah, I agree properly basic beliefs are the same as the magic eight ball. And it's been demonstrated and to the satisfaction of everybody because they literally asked Plantinga, what is the criterion for what de determines a properly basic belief? Is it cultural? And gave a bunch of examples. He said, yes. And the well, Internet and Psychology of Philosophy section seven, where it okay, goes sure. through this. I, I'm not just, I'm not going to purely regurgitate Plantinga. But so what, and I, I think he in other contexts said this, that a properly basic belief, if we're saying like the criteria of what makes it that, is a belief that can't be further inferred from outside information. So it's like, let me make sure I'm, I'm explaining this properly. It's not built upon further foundations of information. It's the immediate experience of whatever it is that you're believing is real. All right. Well, that's that's the problem is that when you try to go into what that means, it fails because it can be anything like voodoo. Well, so no, okay. So you're right. You're right about that. And even the the further other examples we gave about like holding up your hands and other sense data and someone that might have certain physical problems will perceive information and light differently. The whole is your red same as my red problem. You're like that's that's obviously a true what you're saying. And, and culturally speaking, they they believe that their experiences 
are correctly described by what they're calling voodoo and other things. But the the objective reality that we are experiencing, and if we're able to infer other things about it correctly, is that's the matter of debate. Is whether or not these methods... Right, right. So, so my argument is, is that we have voodoo and we have free will. Which one is right and which one is wrong? So I, yeah, I, I think free will is right. Voodoo is wrong. Okay. No evidence. I'm not asking for your opinion. I'm asking for evidence. Like that's another way of saying the same thing. When I, if I give you evidence, if I say this is the evidence, I, that that's also saying I believe this is the evidence. Like, this well, just... no, no, I know what you believe. That's I'm asking for the evidence. Your belief doesn't help me. I want to know the evidence. So, I think another way to explain this. Are you familiar with what I just explained? That is your red the same as my red thing? Yeah. Okay. So the the the, the qualia itself, the the immediate experience has an objective reality. I think we're going to agree right. on this. We're trying to experience reality. Right. And when, when we describe it, not everyone's going to, I don't think everyone perfectly experiences the same way. At least we can agree on sense data. Now, what we'll probably agree on from there is that sense data is largely agreed upon. Uh, and then that the, the cases that disagree are, and at least if we're talking scientifically, the cases that disagree have uh, some kind of disability or deformity on why that would be the case. Like we, we can, explain okay. that i think we're actually going to agree on all those points yeah but the experience itself is still foundational right like, like not going right. to go further than that yep so we're experiencing reality and i think we granted this early in the in the talk so from there there's other things that people are claiming you know, like your voodoo or god or religions holy spirit whatever free will so there's other things people are claiming that they're experiencing the reasons we're going to reject the outside corner cases of sense data those, those, what I would call the feeders, the people that are defending their other beliefs don't believe that they're sufficient defeaters. And that's really where the conversation should focus. So I think from there, I think it would be profitable because it's getting a little late for me. If you can give me a written critique from there and the other things you want to include. And then if you I want to someday, we can follow up on that so I can read yeah, it. Yeah. So, we... so here's, here's my main argument is the properly basic beliefs does not work as a criterion because anybody can like people have different properly basic beliefs that are mutually exclusive and we have no way to differentiate which ones are real and which ones are imaginary. We know some are imaginary. So that prop, that methodology well, fails. I think we have ways of distinguishing. And I think largely we're going to agree on a lot of those methods. We're just disagreeing on this specific one and we'd probably disagree on a few others, but in, in this talk, we're disagreeing on this specific one. Uh, well, that, that's my thing is this specific one properly basic beliefs can't differentiate between what's imaginary and what's real because there are mutually exclusive ideas that both qualify equally as properly basic beliefs and they can't both be true. So without that criteria doesn't work. We, we know that criteria doesn't work just like the magic eight ball doesn't work. Well, the, the defeated reason I gave works clearly like we, we can know that these people specifically aren't experiencing the reality and, and there's a reason why we're agreeing on that and they're not. So like the, the, there's clearly well, that. Well, no, I'm disagreeing with you and the voodoo. Free will and voodoo are equally as false. I know, I know. but you, you're, you're, you're saying that you're agreeing so, so, with me on, on the sense perspective point. Right, I think therefore I am, but then the free will and the voodoo are equally false. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the physical sense, like the, the blind people, for example. So there are blind right. people, and it, like but, if we never went out of our way to explain that they're blind, right. their reality would be obviously completely different. Yeah, so sense so, experience is verifiable. We, we do have ways to show sense experience is not imaginary and is real, but we don't have ways to show free will or voodoo because those are both equally well, as unjustified. We're, we're going a little fast. So so we're, so we're agree on that point. Now, you, you went the next step and says we have ways to show that sense data is real. Yeah. I agree. What I'm saying is the, the, the belief that it is real starts with the experience, and then we, we can remove the defeaters or say that there are none to justify it well so so again the defeaters don't matter here like it's a burden of proof fallacy you don't believe something until you have defeaters it's the other way around you it's imaginary till demonstrated otherwise not real until demonstrated yeah, and not the, imaginary. The demonstration is going to be experienced so it, it's still going to come down to the experience and and you're i know you're rejecting that is what i think is the essential quality that maybe in the context oh yeah yeah so so one of plantinga's arguments is the um you should believe you can believe something until it has defeaters that is just a straight up burden of proof fallacy we know that doesn't work well, uh, okay, that, that's that's a little bit uh, of a sim oversimplification. It it's you're only believing, uh, yeah, yeah. But the the reason I bring that up is because the the thing you're believing is just anything. It's specifically things that are well, only no, that's that's the part I'm saying. It is literally anything. It applies to voodoo. It applies to magic fairies. It applies to great pumpkins. It applies to literally anything. That's the objection to the properly basic is that it applies to anything. It's culturally well, determined. It's arbitrary. It applies to literally anything. I, I, 
uh, I'll read the quote, but I, I really yes. don't think that's right. Internet Encyclopedia Philosophy, Section 7, Objections to sure. Reformed Epistemology. Yeah, there's, there's other contexts where he's gone into details and other quotes that I could I could find. And Please do, because this because this pretty much debunks all of the properly basic stuff in like one fell swoop and shows it doesn't work. So if you can show that this is incorrect or something, please do, because it kind of right. debunks all of that as evidence. Okay, so so I'll, I'll at least I'll finish up with my description here. And then we'll, when we if we ever come back, I can give you the information I'm referring to, but um, the the experience itself, it's not that it's not any belief. I, like when you when you refer to it as being cultural, it's beliefs that aren't f further based on other information. Like so, like I don't believe that space time is curved because I experienced that. Like I just don't. I, I think that's a pretty clear perception. That that is the conclusion of large amounts of other information and inferences that I've derived that did start with fundamental experiences, whether it be sense data or not. And that's what I believe Planica is talking about. Now I'll, I'll follow back up with that. I'll check out because I've read the work once and I mostly just talked about it with other people. And I've seen a few interviews. I'm not like a hardcore Plantica person, but I mean, as far as that concept makes sense to me, I do go along with it. But I'll, I'll just I'll end it with that. If you want to send me the the written critique to I guess the the best version of what we talked about and try to formulate premises and the last part about properly basic belief, we can follow up again and continue. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just looking at the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy for what is it? I think it's Reformed Epistemology is the actual page. Yeah, it's Reformed Epistemology, and uh, you go down to a segment where it says Linda Zagzabisky, I hope that's pronounced right, has offered an objection to like this one. She claims that reformed epistemology has failed to meet the blah, blah, blah. If a belief is rational, it's rationally recognized in principle by rational persons in other cultures. And this is where it goes into the whole segment about why it doesn't work. Okay, sure. sure. Send that to me. I'll juxtapose it with other places I've seen plan to get explain it and go into detail. Sure. And, and obviously it, it's not, I'm not going to hinge all of that on whether or not Plantica explains it that way because I, that's how I was explaining it in this particular argument. But well, as far as I know, to... every version faces that problem. There isn't properly basic; just doesn't work as an idea. Yeah, that, that might be a, a better part to go into more in another video. And I might check out your because you said you had videos about. It. I'll probably check out just to make sure I don't try to regurgitate too much of that. I want to advance it. Okay. So, um, I I probably is that it really early, or do you want to just send me the link? It'll be easier to find. Uh. Yeah, I could right. link. It's yeah. a pretty short link. Um, it's just Google. Um, sure. Who is the person you talked with about it? Is it is it in the title of your video? Oh, uh, I probably Ben Arbor. Ben Arbor. Okay. Is that the? I'm sure you've touched on it before in other topics, but was that the only video where it was like exhaustive on that? Yeah, I think that was specifically about like the ontological argument. And I'll check out that one because when, when, if we follow back up and talk more about that, I want to do my best not to just regurgitate a lot of the same information. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Cool. So yeah, yeah, send me that. And um, I mean, I'd love to keep talking, obviously, but it's getting late for me. Yeah, so. for me too. <laughs> so, yeah, I sent uh, you the link in Twitter. Cool. All right, I'm going to go eat some dinner. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, me too. All right, cool. Thank you very much for having me on. Yep, see ya.